Hit it. Hold on. I didn't have the script ready. Hold on. Okay. Let's do, do you it. really need to know the script when you're saying your Just name? Just put all this in. Just leave all this in, Lena. Here we go. Hit it. It's Friday, July 16th, 2021, episode 140. I'm Patrick Serezna. And I'm Kevin Muir. This week, we welcome to the show Harold Jacobson, quantitative portfolio manager and volatility specialist. We talk about how he got into the business, how he trades volatility, and why his brokers won't give him quotes on Mexico peso, South African rand options anymore. Then it's talking charts with Patrick, Lord of the Crayons. Patrick tells us what we're all dying to know. Do the, do the colors taste any different? <laughs> and this week in trading history, we go back to the IMF bailout of Russia, and we end with the segments of No Stupid Questions and Skin in the Game. And folks, we might even drink some beers along the way, so stick around. We got a great show. Lena, hop on. What beer are we drinking this week? This week, we're drinking Junction Nitro Pilsner from Junction Craft Brewery. Uh, you know, Lena, when you picked this one, I, I was kind of wincing. Oh, why is that? Nitro. Like, this that's just not something you want in your beer. <laughs> well, you got you to gotta hear what the brewery had to say about it. All right, beer. let's hear it. Go. A super refreshing, unfiltered Pilsner infused with nitrogen to give it a dense head and a fluffy mouthfeel. Shake and pour fast. Mm. Oh, God. It's, it's the what head and the fluffy what feel? <laughs> I, like, jeez, they got to just... I'm choking on the beer. <laughs> <laughs> it's like Tobias. It's still, it's actually, it's actually it's delicious. Yeah, It actually is really good. Uh, uh, listen, before we go any oh, further, we got to give a big shout out to uh, Count Truculent, who came up with this week's cover art. <laughs> How off <laughs> epic is this? <laughs> it's so good. For those who don't know, uh, the, you know, that are listening to this... Um, you know that, uh, what is it, a meme with uh, Padme and Anakin Skywalker? <laughs> or the one where, the one, you know, yeah. <laughs> the four. Well, Count Truculent here, he made one with Patrick and myself, and it says, and the number one thing to watch next week, and then there's a picture of me, and it says, surely it's not the dollar again. <laughs> and then it's just Patrick staring at us. <laughs> and it's me, it's not the dollar, right? And not, but it's not the, dollar the, again, the right. picture that he chose of you with that look of disappointment <laughs> on your face it was epic. So but good. even better, he's got the zero hedge laptop uh, uh, yeah, in the so back. He's got Patrick's with the zero hedge laptop in, the, in behind. And then he's got my wall is covered with I love Canadian oil and gas. And then an AOC poster. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got the Lacey Hunt uh, we'll have to Sean Cassidy this mashup. <laughs> It's so good. Count Trucula, you really outdid yourself. It's awesome. All right. Okay, Let's... let me do the side effects. Nothing in this podcast should be viewed as investment advice. Listeners should consult an investment professional before making any decisions regarding topics mentioned in the show. Side effects of too much huddle may include Bitcoinaria, <laughs> the juicy Serezness. Oh, God. <laughs> and premature despeculation. Oh, gosh. From the sizzling grizzly. Thank you for sending those in. We were needing some, and those are awesome. Well, you know what? In, in, for all the Slavic people uh, out there, the right, the right pronunciation of that is the juicy Cheresnias. They all know what it means. Oh. It's, uh, but it's the right pronunciation of that. All right. Let's, uh, let's get to the first interview. That's a little too inside baseball for all of us. <laughs> it's our pleasure to welcome to the show Harold Jacobson. Harold is um, a quantitative portfolio manager, and I came across his blog. Uh, it's on Medium. It's uh, volquant.medium.com, uh, I believe. And I was immediately struck by Harold's ability to talk about volatility and explain things that are very complicated for a lot of people in an ordinary way. And uh, I thought it was absolutely superb. I reached out, and he's uh, agreed to be on our show. Harold, thank you for coming. Thank you for having me. So pleasure have, to be on the show. Yeah, you have the great pleasure of being the first person from Israel on our show. <laughs> yeah, that's that's the first. <laughs> Why didn't you tell me a little bit about yourself before we kind of jump into all the numbers and stuff? Why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself? Like, how did you get into the business? It is kind of an unusual place to be. It's not one of the big, you know, London, yeah. New York, uh, Tokyo. Yeah, or anything like yeah, that. yeah, yeah, totally. So, from a very young age, I was fascinated by by money and finance so when i was like 12 or 13 i worked at my grandparents um, store so they used to have a, a home decoration store so wallpapers curtains carpets and whatnot um and my grandmother who i 
dearly appreciate and cherish and love. She had a lot of faith in me. So, okay. so she used to send me to the bank um, with the daily deposits. So just imagine yourself <laughs> like a 12-year-old kid going with, a, with an envelope full of cash to the bank like 15 minutes away uh, to make deposits. So today I, I would say that that's crazy. That's just crazy. Just sending a kid with, with an envelope full of money just... Yeah, like you, walking you down the street is like the busiest street in Tel Aviv. Uh, <laughs> but, but she had a lot of th- faith in me. Anyway, so at that point, I started finding that money and monetary policy uh, or monetary um, system is, is extremely uh, interesting. Like, right. so, so she taught me about interest and how do we make money out of money and, and all kind of like finance one on one? And I was like, I was blown away. And I, I remember because I, I was like 12 and I'm like, what? That's crazy. You were hooked. Uh, you were instantly yeah, hooked. Your I was, I was, I hooked. was hooked. And, and like the, the focal points in, in my like 12 year old career, like as a, as a, as a finance guy was that she sent me to buy phone exchange. So, oh, okay. So, because, because they were importers, right? Right. Okay. So she sent me to buy phone exchange. And then I asked her, why do we need to take uh, other countries' money? And why uh, is our money worth less than what their money was? Because like, we, we, we were paying like a, a, a thousand shekels and we were getting like, I don't know, like $200 right. in return because like, there was like one to four uh, exchange. And she explained to me how the system works. And I was like, I was blown away. I was just so blown away. Right. And I said, okay, this is what I want, want to do for the rest of my life. I, was, I want to deal with money because right. that's just a crazy. You got hooked. You got hooked. Yeah, that's just crazy. So you, know, you grew up like in a regular household in terms of yeah, like, you yeah, yeah, a private yeah. school or anything no, like that? No, no, no. So, so I went to a public school. Um, fast forward like 10 years. I was after my military service. Um, military service in Israel is a mandatory service, so right. you need to do it. Um, I was like 23 when I uh, decided that I need to take on the next chapter of my life, which is like the academic uh, chapter. So I wanted to go uh, and, and study economics and, and finance because this is what I want to do since I was 12. Right. Um, but, uh, but I wasn't a, a grade A student and I couldn't get into a, a, the best faculty. So I went to an okay faculty, assuming that at some point, if I want to pursue uh, my MBA, I will get a better GMAT or whatnot and, and, and will improve my grades. Okay. Um, so so started the so took my BA in economic and like halfway through the through the through uh, the, the the degree I decided that I want to start my career in finance. Um, so uh, I found that Super Derivatives used to be a, a startup company in Israel specializing in in derivatives pricing. They are they are hiring, um, mm-hmm. but I do I. I knew absolutely nothing about derivatives, derivatives market options. I, I knew literally nothing about it. Okay. Um, so I went to an interview and like the guy who interviewed me uh, was the head of the department and he asked me questions about derivatives and options, and, but I knew nothing. So I told him, listen, I don't know anything about it, uh, but I will be more than happy to learn about it. So he gave me a book uh, and he told me, okay, take the book over the weekend uh, or I'll I'll schedule an interview for you next week. If I like what I see, then I'll hire you. So he gave me John Hall option futures and other derivatives. You know, you know I, I don't mean to interrupt here, but that's a good Canadian. That guy is a, Cana- <laughs> that guy is a Canadian yeah, yeah, professor. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, and, and, and that's, I, a, and that's actually, a little bit of a steep book to give of someone. That's not a good one to like, uh, it's not exactly uh, friendly for someone who's never seen derivatives before. Yeah, no, but, but I have a funny story because I I also had him sign. I also had John Hall signing by the book. Like oh, I have a, co- a signed copy of. of oh, his where book. did you did you meet him on on your travels or was he yeah, in Israel? Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so he's, he's like he's like uh, uh, I have I have few quants that are like like uh, idols for me, and and he's one of them. Like okay. he, he's one, and the other one is, is Peter Carl. Anyway, so moving on. Uh, so so he gave me the book, and I took the book, read it over the weekend, and I, and I just couldn't 
take it down. Like I read that, but cover to cover, and I was like blown away by this market, this derivatives market, this notion. I was just so fascinated, and I was like, man, this is this is literally what I want to do. Right. I want to trade derivatives. I want to price derivatives. I want to live, eat, breathe derivatives. That's what I want to do. So this company that you're applying to, what do they do? I'm not familiar with it. Are they so, a pricing yeah. company so, or so, are they a money so, manager? No, so super derivatives um, was like a, a derivatives pricing firm. So what they do, they developed a, a pricer, like a, like a Bloomberg pricer. or oh, okay. Yeah, so they used to price any kind of derivatives that, the world around, like uh, right. from options like vanilla options to second, third, fourth order derivative uh, exotics, like they were pricing everything. So, so now, like, but you you don't have a degree. You don't, you're not like a math guy. You're no, just no, like, no, no. So, <laughs> yeah. So, so this guy hired me to do like market data uh, analysis. Okay. So, so for the next month or two, uh, the only thing that, that I did was just looking at volatility surfaces that were generated and try to find like errors or, or bugs in the, in, in the, the volatility surfaces. So okay. I was looking <laughs> at numbers and I was like, okay, how do they generate those volatility surfaces? Because there must be something behind that that generates those numbers. So my manager told me, okay, go sit with the quants that developed the models, the, the, the volatility surface models, and, and, and speak with them and learn from them. So I was talking to, to the quants, and, and then I realized that I don't have the sufficient background to understand the quant behind um, derivatives, right. like the quantitative process behind the derivatives. Okay. Uh, because I was taking, I was taking economics, and there were like physics and mathematics, and like all kinds of hard science uh, quants. Um, so, so, so I, I was at the focal point because then I said, okay, I took the wrong um, degree because I, I needed to take a degree in mathematics while I took a degree in economics. Right. Okay. <laughs> And and the, when you realize it, that like after you took half of your degree and you're kind you're kind of in a position where you would, you ask yourself whether you need to take a stop loss on your degree and and switch to mathematics, um, but I decided that I'll study like hard science like mathematics calculus probability theory linear algebra everything I'll start learning myself from scratch. So okay. took like evening courses like online weekends like holidays i just learned everything that i need to know to be able to read quantitative um, papers wow. to be able to 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 generate a uh, volatility surface or to build a, gen a volatility surface model so just learned everything from scratch like i self taught um, the I, I taught myself just how to do that okay uh, anyway so two years after that so th this was like 2006 i i got into super derivatives 2008 uh, a big um, portfolio manager at one of the prop companies in israel uh, heard of me and he, he came to me and asked me whether i want to join his team as a as a quant strategist okay. uh, because he was doing grades and he wanted me to do a uh, foreign exchange and and more of the option like option option book to run right. this option book okay. uh, i was quite hesitant because i never traded in my life um, and I said, okay, maybe we should do like a part-time quant position. So I'll keep working at Super Derivatives and I'll do part-time quant strategies for you. And, and we'll see how it goes. So September 2008, September 1st, actually, 2008, I joined his team. <laughs> Two weeks later, Lehman Brothers goes bust. So yeah, this was my welcome present uh, joining the, the markets, like doing <laughs> trading. <laughs> Yeah, and this this actually goes with me for the rest of my career because I, then then you'll see what happens next. So so 2008 was my welcome party to the market. <laughs> market was like all over the place, went into a limbo. You saw like crazy moves in the market, like because I was doing effects, so you would see Australian dollar moving like 10 percent a day, and like Canadian dollar, like the loony moving like crazy, and like man, that's just like. That's just crazy. I'm like, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed because I never traded in my life. And this is what I get when I start trading. Yeah. And so that's a, that's I didn't quite know a, what to that's expect. Quite a, that's quite a welcome, uh, you know, to the trading world. 
getting yeah, thrown yeah, in yeah, there yeah. right at September of 2008. Yeah, basically yeah, so, the most volatile period that's ever been. Almost, I would, I would guess. Up until 2020, yeah. Um, so, so, so I, I, I've done that for the la, for the for the better part of the following two years. Um, then in 2010, I decided that I want to become a full time uh, quant trader. So April 2010, I start, I joined this team as a full time uh, quant trader, and two weeks after that we got the May flash crash, like May 6th uh, flash crash. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this like, this, this goes on and on and on. So, yeah. So, so two weeks after I started doing my full-time quant trading, I got the May flash crash and I was like, I just stood there and, and, and watched the market and I'm like, okay. <laughs> now, did you get hurt? What, get were you, any, you were... any, any more crazy than, than what it is now? Right. Yeah. Well, did you get hurt during that May crash? No, 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 like... no. Because, because, uh... because, because, because my in, like my bias as a trader, and and I know that my people might say that I'm like a, a I'm a chicken or like I'm a I'm a very um, risk averse trader. I like to be more long gamma than short gamma, so I don't like to sell naked options. It okay. just doesn't make any sense to me. So I have a bias to be long gamma, and people say, yeah, but we don't like. The, the theta bleed, but I'd say that I like to sleep better at night than than, yeah, fair than, than, than not uh, the, not liking the theta bleed. So yeah, so so 2010 got the May flash crash, did okay, was was a very profitable day, profitable day for me, uh, and and then I continued trading uh, at at that firm for the for the next nine years. Okay, or so doing mostly effects rates uh but but my 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 bread and butter was fx volatility both in developed markets and emerging markets i have a soft spot for uh, the commodity currencies like australian dollar canadian dollar and new zealand dollar all of the all three currencies are, are pretty much like favorites of mine so, yeah um 2019 i had the opportunity to expand my mandate to do global volatility trading, so expand to equities and commodities. So I joined the Porto. Um, since joining, I've, I've done um, mostly uh, equity trading uh, in U.S. markets, in uh, European markets, as well as uh, foreign exchange that I've done before that. You know, uh, so Harold, is... it was it was you changing the mandates again that brought about the 2020 uh, March uh, event, probably. <laughs> yeah, I guess, yeah. Because every time yeah, you change yeah, mandates, yeah. there's an event. So maybe that's what that was. Yeah, yeah. I guess like every single time that I that I did a change in my career, like it it, it was something to do with the markets. Like the market, we we seem to have something in common. Like we, right. the market and I changed together. So so you are a global volatility manager. You can trade yeah. basically any sort of volatility that you want yeah yeah if, if there are options on that i'll trade it right like, literally okay so what listen why don't we go through here i i found as i mentioned your medium uh, blog and i uh, jeez it's like some of the best written uh, explanations about how volatility is traded, well, how it works and stuff like that. I, I Let's just start with this. Uh, so you want to trade options, volatility trading 101. Yeah. I, I would love it if you just kind of give us, uh, your in your words, uh, walk us through this and eventually get us to this volatility gamma theta triangle, which I think was a very unique way of looking at it. And it's something I, I just yeah, love you to highlight. Like, yeah, I, I think. To begin with, I think like people sometimes try to overcomplicate like the 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 concept of derivatives. Okay, uh, I, I I understand why because it's a complicated subject. But I I think that like if you if you can simplify things, try to do that. I, I I'll give you an, an example because I have uh, two kids, like two daughters, um, twelve year old and nine year old daughters, and they, they know mathematics, but they don't know derivatives market, obviously. Uh, I try to teach them the concept of random walk or Brownian motion. And you would think that learning about Brownian motion requires some, some high-level mathematics and like quantitative understanding, but I was able to do that in a fun way that just explain to them what uh, a Brownian motion is. And they were able to generate um, uh, random samples and like, they, they were just, there was it, it was so fun to them that, that that got them into 
and trying to understand how options work. Okay. Okay. So, so basically, like, what I wanted to do with with that like blog post is to to, to give a, a like a, a like a, I would say a derivatives one one or option one one to ex- to to explain that options are not that complicated. So basically, when we talk about options, we think about like how options are priced and and how we can use it to 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 make like uh, strategies, right? Like strategies in in volatility uh, in my case. So because when we see um, the, the 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 formula, the Black Scholes formula, we we ask ourselves like. What the half is this formula? How can we understand it? But yeah, at the end of the day, ugly. it's pretty ugly. Yeah, looking it's for pretty ugly. And if, if if you go through the the the, the actual proofs, like the Itolima and the partial differential, the, you would never understand. It. Right. But at the end of the day, just we can split that into two parts, like the intrinsic value of the option, which is how far am I in the money. Okay. Okay. So, what's what's my current spot? Uh, what's my the, the the distance between the current spot and my strike? Right. Which is bounded by zero, obviously. Yeah. And what's the time value of the option? So the time value is basically time uh, multiplied by the variance, like because because the greater the variance, the more the more valuable the options would be, because the right. more the more time and the more the, the 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 more likelihood is that we will go in the money or farther into the money. So right. this is so basically. Ver- so I'll just interrupt there. For variance is also volatility. Uh, just it, it's how it's how much the option or how much the underlying moves in price. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. No I just <laughs> for me, it's, it goes to... without saying. So yeah, I, I don't yeah, mean. No I just wanted to make pay sure for too much those... attention to that. That's right. So so yeah. So basically, wh- when we understand those two parts, we can basically price any options on any kind of derivatives, right? Because we know that, like, on any kind of asset, sorry. So so we have the int- the intrinsic value and we have the time value, and we add, add two of them together and we get like how much the option should go. So, okay. So basically, if you want to price uh, an add the money straddle. Which which means that you buy the put and you buy the call. So basically, there is a there is a very close like approximation, which is four 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 fifth times spot times uh, volatility times the square root of time. It's just an approximation, so it's 0.8 times spot times four times time. Okay. So that tells you how much. Or in, or in plain English, it tells you how much the asset needs to move for you to break even. So if you if if the option costs you let's say ten dollars, uh, the, the the strategy, so it needs to move either uh, up ten dollar or down ten dollar for you to make money of a single day. Okay. Okay. So that's that's called the break even straddle, or the other money straddle break even. Okay. And, so, and just so they, people understand, it's how much the, the, the underlying has to move on a regular basis through yeah. the life of the option yeah, as opposed yeah, yeah. to just like buying it and leaving it. This, yeah, is, this, yeah, is, yeah. this is kind of the pricing that's implied in there about how volatile that underlying yeah, security will yeah. be during the life of that option. Yeah, exactly. So if we price like a one-day option, um, let's say at a 16 vol and Every time that you speak with a trader who wants to give you an example, we'll give you a 16 volt because it is the easiest thing to do because <laughs> it implies that the 1% moves in the underlying, right? That's right. Like <laughs> that's like the, the rule of 16 goes for every single uh, option trader that, that, I've, that I've known in right. my they, life. They all love the 16 because it's easier yeah. to figure out yeah, how, many, it's how, many, easiest, how yeah. much it's going to move on a daily basis. Yeah, exactly. It. Okay. Yeah, so 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 let's say that if we, if we price an option at a six at a vol of sixteen percent annualized in annualized term over one day, it should move approximately one percent times point eight. So it's all point eight percent in one day for you to break even. Okay. Obviously, as we go as as time as as our options goes farther, like as time goes from one day to ten days, we need to move farther. Right. Obviously. Because okay. it grows, it grows by by the square root of time. Right. Anyway, so so this is basically the the the, the first thing that we need to understand when we when we trade options or when we price options. How much is a straddle? What's the price of the of a straddle 
and how, how do we price it. Then, after we understand what's, what an option price is, we need to understand the grids, right? Because every option has derivatives. So how much does the option change with, with respect to, to the spot change, the downline, to the underlying spot? How much does this change with, with regards to the change in the, in the volatility? So all those Greeks are, some, are, are, are very important for us when we trade options. Right, okay. Because it, first of all, it helps us uh, approximate how much are we going to uh, gain or lose uh, over us uh, with respect to changing the underlying uh, parameters, and second because we want to uh, to to risk manage our option book like right. general. So, so why, don't you, why don't you talk to us about the volatility gamma theta triangle? Yeah, yeah, How yeah, those yeah. Three interact. Yeah. So 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 the way I see it, there is a a, a very nice triangle between volatility. Theta and gamma. So theta, for anyone who, who doesn't uh, who, who doesn't know, it's the, the 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 decay of the option. So, what's the time value of your options? How much how much do you lose over one day or gain over one day passage in time? The gamma is how much like the the second order approximation of the underlying spot. So, how much does your delta changes with with respect to spot? And that's the, those two theta and gamma. They are very important for us. Why? Because when we have a lot of gamma, that means that you don't need to have a significant move to um, to to make money or to lose money. It depends on your position. And when you have a, a, a high theta, you, it means that you get you get compensated or you pay a lot of money for holding the options. Now, both gamma and theta, they they are driven by one single factor, which is volatility. So this is how it goes. So the higher the volatility, the higher your theta is, but the lower your gamma is. Why? Because when when you have a high volatility, the options lose the option loses a lot of decay every single day that that that, that of time passage. Right. Okay. Because the time value is is very significant. Like the higher the volatility, the more significant your time value is. The, on the on the flip side, you have a you have a very low gamma, because the the higher the volatility, the gamma the gamma just decays. Uh, like I, I wouldn't say exp exponentially, but it decays significantly compared to having a low volatility. Okay, I'm with you. Okay, so so what what we need to ask ourselves is okay so. At some point, we have a uh, high volatility, so we have we have less we have less gamma and we have more theta. So so if we own the options, it would take us a very significant move to break even on our options, right? Because like let's say that we have vol at forty, then it means that like if we own the options, then we need to pay a lot of of theta. But our gamma is relatively low. Anyway, so I came up with with a with kind of of a triangle relationship that says that if if I want to own an option, I want to have a, a low volatility because then I will have a lot of gamma and pay less theta. But if I want to sell options, I want to have a high volatility and then I will have a lot of theta and be short very very low gamma. Right. Does okay. that make any sense to yeah, you? Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. So, so this is what I talk about when I talk about like the, the gamma, the gamma theta uh, vol triangle. So, like, volatility just drives both, both gamma and theta, and we just need to understand how they work and how right. they interact. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about your trading. And so now you sit around and you, you're examining vol surfaces. You're looking for things. You already mentioned that you don't like being outright short volatility because you like to sleep at night. Yeah. So walk us through what, as a vol trader, what you're looking for and what attracts you about certain traits. Yeah, so so volatility, like, I think that, that looking at volatility surfaces for many years just – gives you a lot of like things to think about like because you always ask yourself okay 
uh, what do I think about like the term structure? Is the is the term structure uh, too flat or is it too steep? Um, is or is the skew too steep or is it like too flat? Or is, so why is don't we skew- why don't we actually explain both of those? So let's start with the term structure. Why don't you explain to people what you mean when you're talking about the term structure of the volatility? Yeah. Curve? So so term structure basically uh, we look at the at the money volatilities across different expiries. Okay. So we look at the at the money volatility for one day, one week, one month, three months, six months, and so on and so forth. This is the term structure. Right. Um, when when usually uh, in time of like quiet markets, the the term structure is is upward sloping because no one afraid from from volatility in the short term, but they always afraid from volatility somewhere down the road, like, let's say three, six, three months, six months, one year from now. So, the, so uh, what that means in English is that we um, people will pay more uh, yeah, for to, uh, farther to, dated options in general, and that's yeah. a normal uh, kind of volatility term structure that we'd be looking at. Yeah, exactly. So if we, if we look at if we look at like the VIX term structure, it's, it's a good example, and we see that like uh, we we've got what we call uh, a roll down of of uh, VIX futures. Why? Because the the close the, the front month expiries, the the they price the lower volatility than the back end or the, right. the further expiries. Why? Because because like uh, insurance company like uh, asset managers and portfolio managers that uh, like in big asset managers, they would pay for for protection on the back end of the curve, uh, but not on the front end because the market tends to be quiet like in, in most periods and, and no one wants to own and the option, the volatility in the front end of the curve, they always want to have a protection on the back end of the curve. Right. So then so why do you the, explain skew, then, and then we'll go and we'll talk to... Yeah, like, okay, so, yeah. So, so, so skew tells you basically what the, the um, implied volatility across strikes and not expires. So per, per expiry, uh, what the implied volatility across different strikes. So let's say in equities, Usually in equities, we have a negative skew, meaning that the puts uh, are priced at a higher volatility than the calls. Why? Because everybody wants to buy protection against uh, a drop in equities and and not uh, uh, a move higher in equities. Makes sense, right? Because we all we all uh, own equities, we all own uh, stocks, and we want to protect ourselves on a on a down move. Right, and not only that, the old adage that the stock market takes the uh, staircase up and the elevator down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think that Jam Corson said that a few times. Yeah. Um. So so yeah. So no one is no one is afraid of of a melt up in equities, but they're all afraid of a meltdown. Although these days we might maybe we should be okay. So you've sat there in years of watching. Watching different yeah, uh, kind of yeah, uh, so, volatility so, surfaces, you see stuff that's mispriced, and, and yeah. are you trying to arbitrage between them? Yeah, 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 yeah. So, so I like throughout the years, I I I started trading multiple strategies, but it's essentially they will all be long, be long um, front front end volatility, which is underpriced compared to what I think realized volatility should be. And emphasis is one on, on what I think realized volatility should be, and not what it is. And 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 be short like uh, expensive back end volatility that I think is is mostly overpriced due to as uh, market structure and uh, and just risk premium. Okay, so on the whole, you like to be long the sh- the short dated stuff because it generally trades too cheap versus realized. And, yeah, and but, then, but 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 again, it, de- it depends on 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 the assets that I trade and right. and like uh, or, or, and on the expiries and on what and on what I think the realized volatility should be and what and what not what it is like right now because people say okay so let's say that we look at like S and P one month realized volatility and we see that it, let's say that it trades at twelve let's say that. Like S and P five hundred real volatility is twelve, uh, but and and we say that we see that implied volatility is uh, let's say sixteen, okay, again sixteen, right. and so we say okay, I, I think that the, the the implied volatility is a sell because it realized twelve, but 
is it going to realize 12 for the next month? Maybe yes, maybe not. So you should have some some idea with regards to what you think real realized productivity, realized productivity is going to be one month into the future. Right, because because I guess that's the point everyone talks about. Uh, historical volatility or realized volatility as you yeah. talk it, but that's a backward looking thing. And whereas yeah, exactly. the options that you're trading today are uh, kind of a forward looking thing. And exactly. yes, the best kind of uh, uh, way to estimate future volatility is to look at past volatility, but that by no means means that it's yeah. going to continue. Yeah. Along that and, way. Al- and also when, when we look at past volatility, you know, like realized volatility as so many ways to measure realized volatility, then you, you need to ask yourself, what, how do I measure realized volatility? Because it's not like a one, one formula for all. Right. So you have you actually have a great post on this, Harold. And I actually, you know, I'm curious about this because I've always just used close to close and yeah. haven't bothered with all the fancy things. Yeah. Why don't you walk us through about how those work and just kind of like try to keep it for yeah, us so, for us non math guys, not yeah, too crazy, yeah, yeah, but. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so actually, this is part of of the, the the strategies that I that I run is that I don't look at the close to close because what I found over the years is that a lot of assets, many assets are what we call mean reverting assets. So if, if we look at like on a close to close basis, we see one volatility, but if we measure it on like on like intraday base, let's say uh, open close, high to low kind of measure, which is like, usually it's called the, the Garmin class seeing Zeng, for anyone who wants to Google that, that up. So it, it would measure much, much higher. So any asset which is mean reverting will have a, a different close to close volatility versus intraday volatility. So just imagine yourself that you there are two guys sitting uh, next to each other and one just look like on uh, at the open and the close and throughout the day just goes to the beach and doesn't is not bothered about the market and the guy next to him just sits all day and look tick by tick. So they, they would meet back and they say one the guy who watched this market all day long was a man the market has been crazy today uh, but the other guy would say what well, it closed the same the same spot as I left the mo- this morning we, this is basically the difference and because when you when we you measure realized volatility you are highly sensitive to the frequency of the sampling right to how okay. frequent you sample the 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 spot or the the rate yeah. or, or and the length of your sample so if we look at one day volatility versus one week volatility we can get a very different uh, we can get very different results but if we and if we if we sample the um, the market every 5 seconds or if we sample the market every one month we can get very different results so it all depends on how frequent you sample the market and how and what your your window of sampling is and and i guess don't shouldn't you be sampling it upon what your approximate hedging strategy or frequency will be? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so. Obviously, uh, if if it, it, I would say that when when you measure realized volatility, it should complement your strategy or your hedging style because I like to hedge extremely frequently, like extremely, like uh, I, I, like guys who, who work with me say that I hedge every single pips in the market, which is not true but okay. but very close to that. so why don't you walk us through the different ways that you can go about if you're running a volatility book and you're let's say long volatility and you're watching your your delta change from the gamma there's yeah. different strategies and different techniques for choosing when to, to hedge why don't you w- tell us what the, you what those are and then explain to us why you like a particular method yeah, so so like when you when you dynamically hedge and, and emphasis on dynamically hedge because like you can just sell or buy options and not touch them until expiry and then hedge once. But when you hedge dynamically, so you need to ask yourself how much theta do I pay per day? And what what's my theta bill on a daily basis? And how much do I need the market to move for me to, to, to break even on that trade? So let's say that I'm long gamma, and I paid uh, in volatility terms 16 
for for like let's say a uh, one week option so on average i need the market to move uh 1% every day so i can make money so let's say that the s&p uh open today um like uh, for uh, 4350 then i need the market to move up 1% and then once it gets up 1% i'll sell my delta because if it moves further then i'm okay because I hedged after one percent move, and then I locked one percent. Let's say that it moved to one percent up, then it moved back one percent down. Then I can buy back the delta that I sold one percent in one percent uh, move higher. I can uh, just buy it back, and then I can make up for the theta through my delta hedging. This is how uh, a basic dynamic hedging works. Okay. Now, now. There are, there are many different ways to, to, to do dynamic hedging, and the problem is that you only know in retrospective what the best way was because <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> option your 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 realized PNL on 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 vanilla options are, is what I, we call path dependent because you only know at the end if you if you hedged uh, successfully or not or if you made money uh, if you if you had an optimal position like strategy or not. Because there are like infinite way uh, a spot can, um, like an, an asset can go from point A to point B, like infinite. Uh, so so basically, you need to ask yourself: Is the market trending or not? Is the market mean reverting or not? And based on that, you need to make a decision how frequent you should hedge your delta. Okay. Some people do it on what, like a time basis. They might do yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So so yeah. So so I came up with three. Uh, ways to do that. So you can say uh, uh, on based on the accumulated delta. So right. let's say if I accumulated x uh, x amount of, of of shares or x amount of dollars, I'll I'll, I'll offset my my delta. Uh, you can do it based on percent change in the underlying spot. So let's say if the market moves one percent, I'll I'll hedge the, the whatever delta I have after that uh, move. And you can do it based on time. So let's say that I, I will add every one, if every five minutes, one hour, one day, whatever. Right. Okay. And what? And now you mentioned that uh, that some of your your coworkers like to make fun of you and say that you are are a little trigger happy when you de- you hedge a lot. Uh, you in your delta yeah. you're moving around. Yeah. Th- they say that they say that that I I don't know how to sit on my hands and let <laughs> and let the move go. Uh, yeah. I, I I have paper hands. I, I just I take profits too soon. You I have, guess. you're the opposite of diamond hands. Now, having said that, that just it reduces the variability in your PL does it not when you're thinking about yeah the... but i don't know how to sit on my hands no i know okay. i just I, I i it reduces the the variance of my pnl right and but but i hedge to i i hedge too frequently i guess because i i don't know how because when i see you know when you see the variance in your pnl you're like it it it, it does something to you that you know you don't you don't want to do and if you are risk averse as I am, so you don't you don't like currency in your PNL both on, on making when you make money and when you when you lose money. So you just you edge you edge too frequently. I guess, a, I guess that's the uh, the problem about understanding all of the math behind behind all of it. You end up being such that you're trying <laughs> yeah. to get rid of the variance in your P in your P and L as well. Um okay, so you sit there, let's go back to your strategy. So one of the things that you like to do is you like to look at the curve, you like to look at the surface, I'm sorry, and you yeah. looked for different uh points where things are cheap or you know expensive yeah. but on the whole you like to buy the front end when it's trading cheaper than what yeah. you f- see as the forward uh realized volatility yeah. like, right is that yeah 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 in short yeah so so like i i like in a, let's say in the facts i i found that a lot of correlation between currencies got mispriced over the years, and and it, it's not that like they, they are mispriced um, because the market doesn't know how to price them. It's just it's they are mispriced because of structural flows and 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 and, and edging flows. And so I know I, I I found a way to to understand cross like FX correlations and and how to utilize them to make successful. Uh, strategies in effects in effects volatilities so now explain that to me so you would go and let's just say let's take australia dollar 
Japanese yen and yeah, you see no. a situation. Let's say let's take something something more uh, sexy. Okay. Let's take the the Norwegian crown versus the Swedish crown because I used to tweet it a lot about it in, in on Twitter. Okay. The... So so you would say that the Norwegian crown and the Swedish crown should have a high correlation, right? Because right. they are both Scandinavian currencies, right? Yep. Makes sense, all in all. Uh, but the matter of fact is that they are not that correlated. Because one is driven by oil and one is driven by proximity to the eurozone or to rates. So while the market or the, the dealers, the banks, they price a 0.8 correlation, they are actually correlated to the magnitude of maybe 0.5, 0.4. Okay. Which means that in, in plain English is that if you price correlation too high, you prices uh, you price uh, volatility too low. Right, because you could you can go and ask for an option on the e, uh, the krona versus the 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 sweet uh, the the yeah, two right no, the cross but, rate. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if you price correlation high, you price volatility low. If you price volatility low, I would go and just buy that from you. Okay, that 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 that's makes sense because and, and and if you look at those two currencies or the cross the, the Norwegian versus the Swedish crown, you will find that they actually this cross realizes far far higher than what is priced in the market. So you're Consistent. saying that the realized volatility of that cross rate ends up often being higher than nine nine times out of ten, I would say. Yeah. Really? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. even though and, and, and the dealers sit there and they see this and yet yeah. they're they continually uh, you know offer it too cheap because they yeah, they're expecting you, I, too I, much. I can, yeah, you know, like I, I have another funny story. Uh, back in 2012, I think um, I asked as a, as, a, as a joke from few banks uh, quote on options for the South African rand versus the Mexican do, uh, the Mexican peso. Right. Okay. okay. Two emerging market currencies that I would never quote anyone because they are two crazy currencies. And back in 2012, they were like ridiculously volatile. Okay. okay? So, uh, so I went to a few banks um, that I work with and I asked them, do you quote Rand versus the Mexican peso? And they said, yeah, we, we can quote you. So I said, okay, just give me a quote for one month that the money straddle in uh, let's say like 10 US dollar 10 million US dollar equivalent okay and they were quoting me um, around like 7.5 volatility so 7.5 percent volatility right. okay which is, well, in FX we, do you just talk in vol like you have an agreed upon yeah, pricing yeah, model yeah yeah and yeah, so yeah, yeah. Like so in FX you only talk for okay. like for me you only yeah. talk for right. so 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 they were quoting Seven and a half fold. Now, if you ask yourself how 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 high volatility on the U.S. dollar versus the South African rand is, it would be back then it would be eighteen or seventeen. Okay, which is 10, vol 10, 10 volatility points higher. Yeah, and if you if you looked at if you looked at the, what the, the implied volatility for the same period for the U.S. dollar versus the Mexican peso was was around sixteen. Okay. Right, okay. which means that, like in plain English, they priced super high correlation, close to 0.9 on on that cross, so 0.7 or 0.7 to 0.9 correlation. So, okay. Harold, did you lift their offer? I lift all the offers, <laughs> but this was the last time that anyone was was willing to quote me. Uh, <laughs> Rand versus Max, and, and I'll tell you why because a uh, few days after that. This cross started to move like I think it moved like twenty fold. Like Rand Rand moved in the morning, and the Mexican peso moved in the afternoon. So <laughs> they, they they got the, the the implied coalition so wrong that they were they weren't willing to quote me after that. Like you, you, never. You, they, they you should, not you should have showed them a good offering on the way out. I can I can help you guys out if you want to cover this. You should have told them. Um, okay, <laughs> so so that's an example of of things that you're looking for in FX. Um, yeah. And so when it comes to this, do you ever just get a time where you're just like you're sitting there and you're staring at it and you're like, God, this is just you know yen vol is too cheap. I'm going to buy some here. Yeah. No. I. I. Yeah. I don't walk like that. No. Nope. Like okay. I. I don't. I, I don't say um, I will buy volatility because it's it's too cheap. 
like on a discretionary level. Okay. Because one thing that I've learned over the years is that like I'm the worst um, discretionary trader ever. Like I don't know how to be a good discretionary trader. Uh, when I have my my data sets and when I have my models, uh, it 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 works. Everything works okay. And when I take discretionary trading, it just doesn't work. Okay, I, so so when you're looking at the data, how do you find? Uh, what would be other examples of? And don't give away if you don't feel like you know giving us too many secrets. Don't don't worry about that. But what would be examples of triggers of things that you would be looking for that yeah, your so, models so, would? Yeah, be? so I so yeah, so I would be looking uh, for two things. One is actually like is the is the market trending or mean reverting like. Like we talked earlier, right? Okay. Um, so and so, how like, do you measure that? Do you like? Yeah. Have... So, so, so that the infinite ways to do that. But what I like to do is I like to look at like the variance ratio. So take like a high frequency measure and divide it by the close to close. Okay. okay? So, so that would tell you if my close to close volatility is uh, higher than my high frequency measure. That basically tells me that the market is trending because let's say that the market opened uh, at point one and like let's say forty three fifty and it closed at forty three eighty, okay. Okay. And 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 if if the market moves in one way, then uh, my high frequency measure will be lower than my close to close. Right. Okay. That 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 would be my variance ratio. Um, I like to look at like what percent, like at what percentile we are in with we, with respect to his, to history in, in like in volatility term. Okay. So if implied volatility is trading at the, the 99th percentile, or if the curve is, is steepness is like on the 99th percentile, then yeah, I might be tempted to to leg into a trade because I think that like, that if we go to the 99th percentile or the 90 the 90th percentile, then yeah, the, my risk reward is, is, is better than when we are in 50 percent. So you assume that the, the, that sort of volatility is mean reverting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Volatility in general is mean reverting. Okay. So you're looking it's for, a, you're looking a, for yeah, extremes. A, yeah, exactly. So like volatility is a, is a stationary process. So it, it, it is mean reverting by definition. Okay. Now you want to, what you want to do is when you when you want to uh, counter the, the the move, you want to do it with with a with a large enough uh, buffer, meaning that you want to short volatility when it's in the ninety or the the ninetieth percentile, and you don't want to short volatility when it's in the fiftieth percentile. Right. Okay. It just doesn't make any sense to you. Yeah. Your risk no. reward is just lousy. Right. Okay. And then what so, are some other? So yeah. So so we said like variance ratio, uh, implied percentile. And like generally, I, I I like to talk with banks and and get the flow from them. Like to ask them, is the flow one sided or is the flow what what how is the flow distributed? Okay, and because will you I find have, that natural flow creates kinks and stuff in the curve that you yeah, can take advantage yeah, of? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because because if you see some some abnormalities in, in, in the in the volatilities, you want to make sure that you're not getting into a position which is going to kill you because of you don't understand the flow. And a, a lot of time people get into a positions when they don't understand the flow and they are getting eaten out. I got it. Okay. And and you know like uh, there, there was a saying that like the like graveyards are full with with, with traders who were long volatility in dollar yen. Right. <laughs> and, and, and and that's that's so true because like I think like two or three years ago was like three years ago, volatility in dollar yen was like around the lowest volatility it has ever been. And people and friends of mine went long volatility, let's say fall of like three percent, like for one month volatility and they lost money and they lost so much money. So like if you don't understand the flow and if you don't understand what goes in, in the market then you, you, you better not trade. Right. Okay, listen, I'm going to ask you about some tweets here you wrote. This is going to be a little more about what's happening in the markets today. Uh, this yeah. was last week, so I will. So you'll have the ability to change it if you want, but I'll just read it out what you said. 
Anyone yeah. who's looking at the different markets probably feel like the U.S. equity market is kind of the odd man out when it comes to risk. If we look at the FX risk proxies, um, high yield versus low yield, they've topped around early mid-May and are now about 3-4% lower on average. Add yeah. to that the dollar rally off the lows, plus significant increase in non-commercial uh, dollar positioning in CF. TC combined with the declining U.S. Treasury yields, and that's usually a sign of bad news. Hold your horses, not calling for a complete sell-off just yet. Yeah. Mo and uh, moving on to global equities, both European equities and Asian equities are lagging far behind the U.S. market. And then this, Harold, I got to take this line. This is an awesome line. Like a friend of mine describes it, they participate in funerals but are not invited to the weddings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, and so, you know, why don't you walk us through what you're what you're trying to say there and give us your feeling about what's happening in the markets right now as we're yeah, staring so, at. So actually, we, we, we kind of started seeing that this week, right? Because when I tweeted, like last Friday or Sunday, market was about one and a half percent. Like U.S. equities were like almost percent and a half higher from where we are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So yeah, it feels like the market, like the the different uh, risk proxies, which I like to look at, which is like Australian versus. Uh, Swiss franc or Australian versus dollar versus yen, um, and and like generally effects like they trade weaker than what you would expect when uh, U.S. equities are in all-time high and just moving higher. Okay. Um, if if we look at the European equities, they also they, they just lag, they, they they lag far behind the the U.S. market. Uh, Asian equities are are way off their highs, their February highs. It just feels like the U.S. market is just like out, out there and it's not moving down, but it should. Like This is what I think or see. Um, I, I don't think that we are going to get like a complete sell-off. It, it's just that people need to reprice uh, growth and need to reprice uh, inflation, even though... Uh, even though Powell says that inflation is transitory, you know it can't it can't be transitory for for years. Like at some point, you either need to see inflation goes down, or you need to admit you are wrong and that inflation is here, and, and you need to tackle that. That's what I was saying. Right. I, I don't think I don't think that. But again, I don't think that we are going to get another fall event like we got like last year. Okay, and why is that? Why do you feel that, you know, that we're not going to get an evolve event? Like, there's lots of people out there saying, "Yeah, because, this can't because continue. It's too cheap. It's gonna, it's gonna, we're, we're gonna, we, we're due we, for we, the big we, one." Yeah, obviously, we 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 kind of went higher in 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 S and P volatility from where we were uh, at the end of June. At the end of June, uh, one month or one yeah, one month at the money uh, or close to the close to the market uh, calls for trading. At the same vol that uh, Australia, the Aussie dollar one month vol was trading, which was I, I, I think that it, it never like I think that for the for the last few years it, it didn't happen. Like, right. That U.S. equities were trading so cheaply, um, uh, so I, I think we got some normalization in, in implied volatility on the S and P. Um, uh, but I, I don't think that you can get like uh, you need you need kind of a of a big event to get. To uh, back VIX to get VIX back over twenty, it's just it's it's a different regime, I think. Like uh, VIX is trading uh, in 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 regimes. So so when you are in in sub twenty, then 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 it's a different regime than when we are trading between twenty and thirty. Oh, okay. So, so you think so, we've slipped down into the lower regime, and therefore you need to be yeah. careful about what you think is the uh, uh, fair value for VIX. Yeah, yeah. So, so, uh, so, so, for you to move back to a regime where, where VIX is trading in the twenty to thirty, you need some 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 decent catalyst, and I, and I just I don't see it right now. So, what what are your some of your favorite trades in terms of the vol space? Uh, you know, when we look globally out there. Yeah, so I I think that like shorting VIX and I and I know I know that it's not a, a popular opinion. Shorting VIX uh, is a good trade as long as you understand the risk and you you have something to 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 offset like 
crazy days when the market goes down. So, what so, do, so, so like, listen, I, Harold, I'm hugely kind of uh, sympathetic to that trade. I, I cut my uh, eye teeth on a, a, a derivative desk, uh, you know, an equity derivative desk, and we were always short vol because historically, you know, front end vol would always trade higher than than uh, the applied would always trade higher than the realized. And yeah. we were a bank and we were able to sell it. So for us, we were always yeah. short. And you know that the, the, there, there is never a good story when you short vol, you know, like, like <laughs> I know that people say that I was long vol in 2008 and I was long vol, long vol in 2020, but you never heard guys saying I was short vol all through the move down. Well, except that guy that has the, except that guy that has the, the, that huge boat that's called more theta. Uh, and I, so I'm wondering if that guy is, you know, that's the, the reality. Um, but but one of the things that I always kind of struggle with in terms of shorting VIX is, yes, when you look at it, it's a great trade. No doubt about it. You look at shorting v, if you were just like short VXX, yeah. which is kind of the uh, approximate same, uh, you know, realized things. Or if you look at just rolling uh, VIX futures over and over again, it's yeah. it's a great trade. But there's moments of sheer terror. So how do you cut off those the kind of the, the those things like what do you do to 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 find ways to be short VIX? Yeah, so we, first of all, when you run global volatility, then you always have something that you can buy cheaper than than than, than the VIX that you sell, right? Because if you buy uh, FX proxies that can offset some of that moving crazy day, then you 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 are not outright short volatility. So ah. let's say that you. So you play some some cross correlation, and you you can always sell a bit of like e mini futures that you know they they have some high correlation, high negative correlation with with VIX, and then you can offset some of that residual variance in, in your book. So even though you say you're not short vol, you will be short certain vol like asset classes and be long things that yeah, you think are going to yeah. correlate. Obviously, obviously you cannot be long only in vol, right? Because then you'll bleed to your, your account dry. Yeah. Okay. So you're, you're always looking for the relatively cheap thing to yeah. buy and the, yeah. and the, and yeah. so on the whole, your whole book might be long gamma, but yeah. you're selling expensive stuff and earning a carry. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah. So that's basically the way to, to, to always harvest some, some, uh, some, okay. So like, roll down right. So you think that the VIX curve is really steep. You might be able to short that. Yeah. What would you look about being long right now? Yeah, so so in in effects, I I like owning vols um, like in in cross crosses that that uh, that I fan of, you know, like the, the Norwegian versus the the Swedish crown. I like Australian dollar in 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 way through a um, few crosses. Um, that's mostly stuff that that you know that are very niche crosses. So. Right. So you're thinking that the FX is trading cheap and that you're finding opportunities to be long there yeah, yeah, versus yeah. the everyone sitting around staring at the S and P yeah. thing and that's where um, the next cross. Yeah. Vol- yeah. Volatility. Yeah. Volatility in TY. If you look at it, like it used to be um, a, a very good way to to express some some opinion that you know. If you can get a, a, a vicious move in rates, um, so put spreads in 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 TY is a good way to 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 express that. Right. That's okay. Kind of the stuff that I do. Okay, so Harold, it's been a pleasure having you. But before we let you go, we got to ask you our three questions. Um, so first of all, let's start with the your favorite investment book, and I don't know, maybe you just gave it away already. No, so so <laughs> if we talk about technical books, yeah. um, so so John Hall's like one of my favorites, uh, Sheldon Natenberg volatility uh, trading. Yeah, that's a great book. That green book. one, yeah, I, I, I love actually, that one. Yeah, and, and I we I actually met uh, I met Sheldon in Tel Aviv, um, and and my boss uh, like he told me, do you know who this guy is? Eh? <laughs> I'm like, no. He's like, he's, he's an idol, and like we 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 took a picture with him, we took a selfie with him. Yeah, <laughs> so I love like Sheldon Natenberg, just like he, he basically does what I want to do is explain options in such a fun yeah. and. and I, listen, I'm the same way, Harold. I, I I read that book and it instantly became my favorite. It explained uh, how a market maker really works in terms of doing it. And to me, it's the whenever someone says, you know, which option book should I read? It's always the Sheldon Natenberg book. Okay, yeah. so so yeah. those and, are the technical if, books. But what's your favorite yeah. investment book? And uh, you know, like uh, I don't want to be corny, but uh, Michael Lewis books. Oh, oh no, Michael Lewis is great. Which one do you like best? Is is um, Flash Boys. 
Oh, you like Flash Boys the best, hey? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I, I, I know you thought I'm going to say Lyle Spoker. No, I thought you might say the, the one with uh, Conamahan and the guys from your, the professors from your neck of the woods. Uh, uh, no, no, no. No? You, what, you, Money Boy? Not Money Boy. Uh, uh, so, no, um, what's the one? It's the, it's the one about the, prof- the psychology one. Uh, no, no, so I, I haven't read that book, but, but uh, I like, like... Uh, the Undoing I Project. I like Flash Boys. Huh? The Undoing Project. That's what you should read. Oh, I never, I didn't read yeah, it. Yeah, so I, I it's uh, like it. the, the little summary is 40 years ago, Israeli psychologist Daniel Kahneman and Amos Traversky, I don't know how to say that, wrote a series of breathtaking original studies on our assumptions about the decision-making progress. That's Really? Yeah, you uh, should go over and read, read it. Yeah, it's a really yeah. good. I, I'll read it tomorrow. Okay. Anyway, so uh, I like the Flash Boys. I like very much. Um, and Lyle's Poker. Yeah. Um, and... Um, the, the book about uh, Just Livermore. Oh, of, Reminiscence, uh, yeah. Stoke Operator. You can't go uh, wrong with that one. You can't go wrong, yeah. yeah. No, that's it. So, I, yeah, I'm those good. are my, my favorite Well, books. Flash Boy is definitely out of the consensus. There not very few people put that. You put that high. Uh, and you know what? It's probably uh, airing, uh, I think owing to your technical, owing to your technical uh, nature, the fact that you love the numbers so much. Okay, next question. Are great traders or portfolio managers born or made? I, th- I think they're, they're made. I oh, think, yeah. You know, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like, uh, you can take, uh, and I think that's, that's something that, you know, eventually I would want to do is you want to take people who you think they have, they have, they have something in them and you want to, you want to build them. I, th- I think that building a trader from scratch is, is something that it, it can, can be done. And I think that it's, it, you're going to, you're going to have better traders than, than traders who are born. Harold, you're too young to remember, but when you said that, it made me remind me of the six million dollar man when they yeah. t- when they took this of this this military guy or what, Lee Majors yeah. and they and they built him from scratch. They rebuilt him from yeah. scratch. Anyways, okay. And then the final question is: if if you were uh, giving advice to a young person today that was interested in our industry, what advice would you give them? Learn, learn, and learn. Always read. Well, learn, you're learn the perfect to example. Yeah, Le- learn to code. Learn, uh, learn uh, like art science and and just learn from your colleagues and and, yeah. and peers well you're the perfect example of somebody that didn't go to kind of school for all those things and just figured it out and bootstrapped it yourself so i think you're the <laughs> year you live that learn 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 better than anyone so listen i'm going to give you uh, your um medium one more shout out here because i really think that people should if you have any interest in vol trading you should be going and checking it out so it's vol quant v-o-l q-u-a-n-t dot medium dot com it's a terrific blog site i really uh, recommend everyone go check it out and why don't you tell people where they can find you on twitter or anything else you want to kind of plug yeah, just 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 follow me on Twitter. Like, uh, I, I I should definitely. Um, I, I was out of uh, the, my medium blog for a while now. Yeah, uh, had a few hectic months, uh, but I, I'll be sure to continue writing blogs. Well, it, and it, it's and evergreen that. stuff that, that that doesn't yeah. really. Need yeah, there, there are there are a few things uh, in the pipeline, but. Um, I I'm, I'll I, sh- I should definitely get back into writing. So uh, your so Twitter just is follow me on Twitter and, and my Medium blog, and hopefully you'll find it interesting. Right. So the Twitter is Volquant as well. V O L Q U A N T. Yeah. And Harold was great. He actually put up on his Dropbox. He gave this great. Uh, um, yeah, but the, Dropbox uh, blocked me. I know. Oh, <laughs> they you, blocked my site. You, you you went and did that, and you were so popular. I remember seeing it, and then I went to click on it to get all the stuff, and it was it was and yeah. it was dropped. Is it back up now? No, no, but but I have my my Google Drive until. Uh, oh, Google you did. You went with uh, Google me. until. <laughs> You gave good old Dropbox too much business. They said, forget this. We're going to go. Yeah, there was too much traffic, I guess. Okay. Well, anyways, Harold, it's a pleasure getting to know you. I know it's late in the evening there, so I do appreciate you. No, it's 9 p.m. It's okay. Uh, okay. But my kids are going going to go to sleep soon. Okay. Well, thank you so much for being here, and we really appreciate you spending time. Okay, Patrick, time for talking charts. Are the greens better than the yellows? All right. Let's uh, first before uh, before we <laughs> get to the taste of the crayons, which uh, which is an important conversation we have to have at some point. But let's let's start with just reviewing what we were watching last week. How's that? Is that okay, Kev? That's good. All right. Okay. All right. So last week we were watching uh, the what the market would react, how they would react to Powell's testimony. What what was your take on it all? 
Well, Powell definitely did a, let's just try to say he tried to put it back, uh, the toothpaste back into the bottle and get a little of the hawkish shift. The tube, uh, the tube, not the bottle. Yeah, sorry, into the, yeah, only I have a bottle of toothpaste. <laughs> um, anyway, so Powell did try to get it back in, couldn't do it. You know, even though he talked to all sorts of dovish, the market just hey, was having none of it. It didn't care. It didn't care. And uh, so number two, uh, we were watching crude oil uh, as to whether the trend could continue or whether or not it was going to be uh, uh, some sort of a beginning of some uh, pullback of some sort in, in crude. So I'm going to here pull up the September contract just for us to look at this chart. And uh, the crude oil failed to make a higher high. And made it all the way down the downside. And uh, what, uh, what I'm curious about, uh, if you look at the, um, the market corrections both in March and May, uh, in each uh, of these moments uh, over here, the market uh, f had a little correction and then tried to break to a higher high and failed. And it began a one-month correction back in March. Over, oh, um, over here in May... Uh, there was uh, two attempts to make a higher high in crude oil and inevitably led to this market correction. Well, it was only a three-day correction, but still a correction nonetheless. Um, and what was interesting is this time around, well, crude oil earlier this week had a chance to go and break to higher highs, and it failed to do so. And it's it going to be uh, the thing to watch uh, and continue to watch this week from last week is uh, have we be seen the beginning of one of these types of consolidations in oil? Before we call it some more ominous bearish drop. Uh, every market gets the rally checked with some sort of a consolidation. Sometimes they last several weeks, sometimes a month or two. It'd be really interesting to see whether this pullback um, and potentially under $70 happens this week. Any uh, comment? Well, actually, I was going to ask you, so if we do get the correction, where do you think it stops? Uh, well, the uh, the fib zones and uh, previous highs lows are all in the mid 60s. Uh, there's a there's a couple interesting points around uh, just under seventy dollars, around sixty nine bucks. But I actually think that uh, a, a mid 60s test. Maybe about uh, ten percent lower on on crude oil is uh, is a very reasonable place for crude oil to consolidate, uh, and it'll be really interesting to see if we get that whether the buy on dip traders buy the dip quickly off of that test down in that zone. Well, I hope you're wrong, but I suspect you might be right. All right, but uh, last thing we were watching was those uh, inflation numbers and retail sales, and hot, hot, hot. It did not give back the at least a, uh, the idea was a short term transitory thing is off the table. It's clearly even if it is transitory uh, from a supply perspective, it's not giving up three months in a row now of super hot numbers, right, Kev? Yeah, so inflation did come in hot. What was even more interesting, though, than the than the numbers beating expectations was how the market took it. Right, and and, uh, and that's what we'll talk about that actually in our top things to watch okay. next week. So we'll save but, we'll save it for that. But, but it, that they did was, come in hot, and no doubt about it. And it, but look, the one thing I'll ask you, and just your opinion, obviously, there's a a whole series of macro traders out there that the rate of change of the number is more important than the number itself. And with the inflation running as hot as it is, uh, do you think that uh, there are traders out there that are seeing that simply it, it's going to be very difficult for inflation to run even hotter than this is? And therefore, if there was some sort of even reversion in these numbers coming up, that uh, this is the turn point? Is, do you think that there's any merit I, to I that? I don't know. So you're basically saying the rate of change in inflation is, is slowed, so we're no longer rising as quickly as we can. Yeah, but I mean, but, but though, isn't the whole idea of putting on the inflation trade to catch the big rapid rise of it and that if it's shifting that this is that's the window to start uh rebalancing Maybe. i guess i guess that's true you know you're you've been listening to keith mccullough a lot there well, patrick with your rate of change um hey, could very well be i listen um, to a lot of macro people but that's certainly one of the t things that keith does for sure yeah yeah and so um i i don't know what to tell you in terms of the uh, then we'll leave numbers. it at that to me it just it just it to me it feels like inflation is, is going to jump around and up and down. And, and for anyone that expects it to go straight to five or eight or whatever the number is that the, you know, the hyperinflation he does think it's going to, it's not going to be the case. So t to me, this is a longer term process and getting too excited about one or two numbers isn't really uh, how yeah. I treat it. The other thing I'm watching though on inflation is like, uh, I to me, uh, the trend in the bigger commodities uh, is really important. And when you see uh, the f like oil, uh, not gas and, and gasoline futures were sort of the last uh, kind of uh, 
major tranche of commodities that were still bull trending while so many other commodities have kind of peaked out and turned a month or more ago. And uh, if oil, though, has put in a short-term top, even if it doesn't mean it has to crash down but just stop going up, it uh, certainly could uh, lead to um, that these things all kind of coming in a little bit uh, in the coming months. Uh, uh, you know, but the million dollar question is maybe that's what bonds are already telling you is going to yeah, happen. Yeah, that's, that's probably the case. All right. So let's talk about the th- top three things to watch next week. Number three, the ECB. Uh, and so we're, we're going to obviously see uh, monetary policy over there. Anything that you're watching in particular? Well, it just listen, it, there's no doubt that a lot of the, the real action is on the fiscal side these days. And that when you look at central banks, all they can do is mess it up. But with ECB, you're always, you know, wary of them doing that. So you should uh, keep your eyes open for them just to make a mess of it and, uh, you know, step on their own thing, you know, as you know, as they say. So um, keep your eyes peeled. Uh, it, it's uh, probably not going to move it, but it unless they do something wrong. But if they, there's always that chance. All right. So number two, we had to talk about these bond yields. Uh, and uh, and just simply the fact that the bond market is not having any of it in terms of uh, the idea that inflation is about to run away and somehow yields are going to go up. Now, uh, I know that uh, you retweeted out uh, that Russell Napier interview, which I thought was uh, really good as well. But, I mean, the whole uh, premise of the argument is uh, the idea that even if inflation is running hot – that they're just never going to let bond yields uh, freely trade and that uh, the whole purpose of re- uh, financial repression is to keep very negative real yields. And, uh, and when you see – like no, but when you see the fact that inflation is running hot and bond yields are not reacting, uh, I mean it, it kind of fits the, that uh, checkbox for financial repression pretty well. I mean uh, do you think I'm just overreading into that? Well, no, but I, I will laugh, first of all, that, that you read the Russell Napier article and took it as a reason to buy bonds. And I well, no, <laughs> I, it's not a reason to buy bonds. I've been long bonds, uh, actually, for a couple of no, months listen, before yeah, that You've article. been doing great. It's great trade. And you've done really well. No doubt about it. Um, uh, so do, do you want to get into my reasons or do you want to get to, like, well, look, I think the bond market. Uh, has, well, let me, let's, let me just quickly look at the technicals and then, and then you can contribute your, your kind of, uh, uh, perspective <laughs> on, mode, uh, like, but, but, the, jumbo. but there is a, uh, what we have is basically since April, uh, when the inflation numbers started to run really hot, uh, a sequence of, uh, lower highs on these bond yields, failed rallies. And every time there's a two, three day pop in, in the, uh, the rates, uh, immediately given back this, uh, this is a very clear downtrend now. And, uh, and really at this stage, uh, I mean, it still arguably could be a Fibonacci retracement, like a mean reverting correction of that huge bond bear that we had, um, uh, since, uh, since the summer of last year. Uh, but uh, you know what? I mean, at this stage, clearly uh, uh, the uh, bond sellers are nowhere to be found at this stage. And particularly since we're seeing uh, broader equity distribution uh, occurring, I wonder whether there's a, a money just coming in here as a safe haven thing. Okay. So I think that there's two things going on. Um, the first is the most important one. The fact is that the market believes that the Fed's reaction function has changed back to the old reaction function, meaning that they view the Fed as having gone, experimented with flexible average inflation targeting, but at the end of the day, once inflation comes, they're going to be pushed around and they will raise rates just like they always have. Okay? And so when that shift occurred... When they viewed um, Powell as a caught crying uncle, we got into this strange situation where stronger numbers meant that the Fed would be tightening sooner and therefore choking off growth earlier. And so if you go look at the reaction to the first CPI numbers, because I think the CPIs were the first, yeah, what you got was the front end of the euro curve, euro dollar curve, or the front end of the yield curve, selling off hard. And if you actually look at the longer end, the longer end rallying. And if I think on that day, I'm pretty sure that was the day, like the fives were down six, 30 seconds, and the 30s were up 12 or something. So we had a massive flattening of the curve. 
And the reason is, is because the, they assume that the Fed uh, economic strength means the Fed comes in sooner and tightens things and slows things down faster. And I think it's as simple as that. And, and it's going to be a question of when does the market become convinced, if ever, that the Fed has actually changed its tune. And, and, and I okay. think that's what, so, why you got Powell trying today or yesterday or the day before, whatever day it was, Wednesday, trying to, to say, to reaffirm their you know commitment to flexible average inflation targeting. And you also had, um, I can't remember, the, the, the Williams, uh, the New York Fed president, getting in there and he made a speech in Israel as well. Uh, and it was also the same thing, a commitment to flexible average so, inflation targeting. So uh, while everything you're saying uh, to, uh, to an average person sounds like you're spewing a lot of really smart knowledge here, Kevin, <laughs> uh, the the part where I find um, uh, kind of divergent from your thing is, is that this is not a U.S. centric yield thing. This is not simply the uh, Powell and the Fed and, and U.S. policy. When you go right across the board. Look, okay, uh, yes, ca the Canadian 10-year yield does track the U.S., but it's got the same trend on the downwards. But uh, go straight across. A German yield collapsing in the last two months, uh, deeper negative. The Japanese yield has been collapsing for the last three months on the downside. Italian yield collapsing. The British yield, um, uh, or that's Greece here, sorry, on the downside. Bottom line is Every bond market on the 10-year government right across the board is going down, and it just can't be just Powell and his statements that yeah, are driving. Yeah, no, so I'm, I'm not going to disagree with you there, Patrick. There's no doubt about it. Right, that. and, and, and there's, more, there's more to it than that. And, and actually, back to your rate of change, I would agree that, that the rate of change in terms of economic growth was – it peaked, and, and I suspect that all those yields peaked at the same time. Right. So I won't disagree with you there. The other thing to think about, though, is that the TGA, the Treasury General account, that that kind of unwinding is is a huge, huge amount of money that has been put into the the, the system. And yes, it is U.S. dollars, but let's face it, the U.S. dollar is the reserve currency, and if there's plenty of liquidity there, it affects everything. Yeah. Um. And and I think that you're going to look back and you're going to say those those that money also contributed to this rally in the bond market, even though you could argue that that. Um, pushing liquidity into the system should be inflationary and should cause the long end to go down. I don't think it did in this case. And I actually think that it was just parked. And, and the, that also is part of the reason we have a bond bid across the world. All right. The, the numbers are just huge. Like they're just yeah. monstrous. Okay. And you're and Patrick, you're also right about the, the reality about the financial repression. And I, I just, where we disagree about that is we disagree about timing. Like yeah. you think that the financial repression is going to occur, you know, with bond yields. At, it's, uh, no, what do you mean? It's all or two no. or whatever. Look, we've been we've been in a period of financial repression for a long period of time. Negative real yields have not have been here for a bit. Uh, and uh, the whole point is it's not going away. And more importantly, the whole point of financial repression is to allow inflation to run hotter so the real yields get ne more negative and that liquidation tax on savers becomes even that much bigger. And so yeah. – so I just think though that buying bonds uh, because they're going to – you're going to experience financial repression and it's just kind of this no buying uh, bonds right now is because uh because i think people are rotating a little bit of out, out of equity and if the reflation trade takes it on the chin i think the equity markets could correct like mike wilson came out uh recently uh uh you know looking for that 10 to 15 percent well let, listen let's talk who's about mike wilson <sighs> who's honestly who's mike wilson morgan stanley Oh, I don't know. You're like you're in the loop. Oh, you're Jesus! Hanging out with all the cool kids. Uh, oh, okay. uh, I still think, though. I tell you, I think that the Powell doesn't shift. Fed doesn't shift. Completely different story. Long end is uh, much higher. I still think it's his fault for shifting and or appearing to shift. And I think he regretted it. And I think that's why he walked it back. All right. So number one thing to watch. Uh, is uh, right now for the last month or even arguably more, we've been having the rolling correction, which is essentially, you know, we talked about it over and over again. The fangs are working. The breath is deteriorating. And more and more of those areas that were in like these little mini bubbles, you, ha you were calling it the rolling bubbles over the last couple of years. Uh, but really now it's become rolling corrections, but it has not manifested on the indices.
The indices continue to make higher highs like the S&P and the NASDAQ. And, uh, but yet underneath, so many of these, uh, these uh, you know, bubbled areas have all started meaningful and deep corrections. And, uh, and things have really rolled over. The question that I'm asking and watching into next week, now that sort of uh, a lot of the, uh, the OPEX kind of pinning that tends to occur, will uh, the, the kind of with volatility potentially coming back next week, will we see this turn into a, uh, more of an index correction where we actually see the S&P and the NASDAQ begin a bigger and deeper market correction? Uh, and I think that's the thing to watch. Uh, I have my view that it will, but uh, but it's certainly something that uh, you know we have to kind of stress test to see whether or not it turns into something more. Uh, you know what's funny, Patrick? I, I I actually thought to myself, oh no, we talked about the series of rolling bubbles this morning, but I realized there's actually Ben Kwasnick from uh, SPAC Research had phoned me up and he'd asked me for my link to my article, and he he also was talking about it, so I. Googled uh, or went through my notes. Do you know when the first time I wrote that about the series like a, of rolling bubbles? It wasn't a decade ago. It was like, what, five years no, ago? No, it wasn't a decade. It's 2014, though, yeah. I found it. There you go. It's been a long time. Well, that's um, seven. Yeah. Like you, you were, you were, you were, you were, no, exactly. But you definitely, <laughs> you definitely were one of the first people that brought it out. Yeah. Kudos yeah. To you no, for that. but I do agree that, that I think that. You're almost trying to create the the inverse of my series of ro rolling bubbles. It is. And, well, that's what you're trying to do. I, I'm not sure I agree. I do think, though, uh, to your point, that if you think about the series of rolling bubbles, we had the meme stocks, right? And the meme stocks, when you pull up the index of those things, or just kind of whatever you well, want to use. You want to like Jimmy? Uh, they're just they're rolling over. It's over. Oh, meme and stocks! Uh, oh, come on, meme stocks. Uh, like for instance, GME put its major high in back in January. I guess you can say that AMC re was the recent one. Like they've been targeting all sorts of different ones. But let's be realistic. Uh, inevitably, everything mean reverts to its fundamental value, and all of this is dog shit. You can only manipulate this stuff. How uh Patrick? 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 Don't you know that AMC is going to a million bucks? And the, the only reason it's staying down here is because they're, I don't know. Are you done? Citadel Are you done? You. Okay. So, um, but anyways, listen, I, going back to the meme stops, we had this monster rally from May to June. Uh, June 9th, it topped. I'm pulling up the Bloomberg index here. And uh, anyone with the Bloomberg that wants to pull it up, it's dot M-E-M-E-R-H, go. And you'll see that it went from, you know, let's just see, what is this? It went from 15 to 24. So what is that? That's almost like, that's more than 50%. It's like 70% or something like that. And since then from June 9th, they've melted all the way back down. They've got, they've given almost all of it back. And I do think that that was a series of rolling bubbles. And I do think that they have starting to shoot these things one by one. My question to you is, do we see, um, certain other kind of longer running bubbles get shot and i'll let you decide which ones I'm uh, i about. i think though that while that is on the table i don't think that 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 market call has to be made right now i feel that uh, the the most important thing to observe is um, you know, like for instance, so this is, let's go back to the market breadth chart that, uh, uh, by the way, that, uh, I thought it was just a great way to story tell. This is the New York stock exchange, uh, looking at the percentage of stocks on the NYSE that are trading above their 50 day moving averages. And you can see that uh, all year, right from the start of the year, sequence of lower highs, lower lows, price deterioration, which is more and more stocks continue to begin new declines on the downside. It's impossible for a stock to be above its 50-day uh, moving average and to be in a correction. So when, when these st stocks are breaking below their 50 days, it's an indication of distribution and, they're, they're, and it's being sold. And what's really interesting is when you look at this chart on the S&P, which looks like this beautiful accelerating uptrend, take the equal weight S&P 500, and it hasn't made a higher high since yeah, uh, since it's April. rolling over. You're absolutely right, right? And it's the Russell yep. and the Russell, uh, just one Dog big shit. Uh, one big topping formation. And yeah. and so what's happening is is that you're seeing that if you don't own um, the Fenton Plus stocks, which you know with Microsoft and then Nvidia and all these other ones like that in there, uh, then you just simply have been, found it incredibly difficult to find anything yeah, that's performing. Been, listen, almost everyone's lost money this past like 
you know, little while. Yeah. It's been tough market for a it's lot a of people. Vi- it's very And I'm sure, listen, I'm sure there's some that have made money and, and nailed stuff. Good for you. Like, great. Like, but I'm saying on the whole, it has been a difficult environment sure. for most Either players. Either you jumped onto the Fang bandwagon or you're, you're treading water here. It's or 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 you're, you're burning data. Short, or, or you're burning shooting, data and you're, or you're sure or you're shooting all the uh meme stocks or small caps. Well, okay, a great trade. Like yeah. if you did that, great. It was good for you. Like it was good trade. Um, uh, but it's just my point is it's been a difficult period because it has been so narrow. Yeah. And for those that are kind of let's face it, it's tough to own the five biggest tech stocks and just close your eyes and forget about it. Yeah. So if you've owned anything else, it's been terrible. And so I agree with you, Patrick. But my question to you is, you look at that and go, this is terrible. It's going to get worse. Couldn't you also make the argument that, look, a lot of this bad news is in there. Now we're going to get, if these things stop going down, we could actually get a rally. I've thought about that. But you know what is interesting is is that um, I'm going to uh, circle back. Uh, uh, shout out to Colin for uh, for getting me Mike Wilson's report. But he actually showed the same breath chart. And his view at Morgan Stanley is, is that, that – and he had that same breath chart up. Uh, he must have been w- listening to our huddle show. So, oh, yeah, so hey, my, uh, Mike, yeah. thanks for listening, buddy. Uh, but anyway, so the <laughs> – but uh, the the way that um, uh, the breath is deteriorating, his view was essentially that it's got to capitulate now and that the buying opportunity will happen but things are likely to first stay in trend and get worse before they get better and um and that will be interesting because like the the fang stocks like okay let's take a uh, apple let's we'll summarize all of them with apple apple has been in an epic run uh you know and this this run for a two trillion dollar capped company running 20 percent in in a in a month is a is a pretty big uh, influence on the whole indice, right? And the thing is, is that you can see it's slowly running out a little momentum. And again, it's not about being bearish on Apple, but if Apple can't uh, take the index any higher, um, then what will? And and if all you have is these Fang stocks go and give half of the gains back in a mean reversion correction, then you've got yourself a full on market uh, drop coming. Now, I'm not forecasting that, but I'm saying it's entirely on the table. Yeah, I don't disagree. The other thing that kind of worries me, Patrick, is if you look, volatility is often bid in in August. And I was hoping we would get more declines in volatility in July, but it doesn't look like it's coming. Oh, We're going to talk about yeah. that in the yeah bang, yeah for uh, sure. Let's save that there. for that. So uh, just uh, let's uh, just so that uh, just in case uh, we don't want to confuse our listeners, let's put up a quick dollar chart. Uh, the- <laughs> But let's put it up with the euro. Uh, but uh, what is interesting is that the euro is approaching some uh, pretty key levels. This 117, 116 zone below uh, was where uh, we've seen consolidation lows in the euro on numerous occasions. And we're a stone throw away from that. So while the U.S. dollar remains in its upward movement, we're, we're, we're approaching a level for the U.S. dollar of resistance or support for a lot of the cross currencies that are coming there. And and so while I think that uh, the trend that's been established may very well stay in place here on the interim, uh, we've got a very, some important technical levels, which makes chasing the dollar here higher have probably a, uh, not a great uh, risk-reward payoff. Uh, I th- while it might be right on a day trade or something, but I don't, wouldn't push it on that. Otherwise, I wanted to just point out how uh, distributive uh, the cryptos continue to be, the assets that shall not be named. Uh, but uh, it's just they, they can't seem to find, put together any days of buying that hold. Very, it seems like a very distributed market. And uh, it'll be really interesting along these support lines whether it gives out or not. Like uh, when, when it, It's sort of like a bouncing ball heading to the edge of a table. And will it roll off? Each bounce is a little uh, lower and lower, coming to a major support line. Just the way you always say there's no such thing as a triple top, you can argue that a support line that's being tested this many times isn't really uh, support and inevitably will give out. It'll be interesting to see whether the next level down is, is uh, going to engage next week. <laughs> engage. Okay. Yeah, well, okay. Shut up, you piece of shit. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but let's look at the oh I- my God. Eiffel Tower I formation. Haven't, I haven't looked at this uh, this uh, lumber. This Dude, is a terrible. So, so chart. now this is where I want to shit on you, inflationistas, for a second, because okay. because on the way up, the amount of people 
on uh, Twitter yeah, that were uh, claiming that that lumber was evidence that inflation and hyperinflation was imminent. No, no, no. Listen, and listen, then listen, you turn listen. around as a, uh, and as a deflationist, no, no, no. you say, all, I never, I, I, I never, I never, I never accused you of it. I said the, yeah. the, 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 but, 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 and this is my problem is that you're the inflationistas were on a certain website that is prone to some hyperbole and prone <laughs> to like the end of the world kind of doomsday things. And that's when I know that I should have gotten out because usually those guys on those websites think everything's going to zero. So when they turned around and said everything's going to infinity, no, you had I zero. Should, you I had zero, kn- Daddy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I should have realized that we have lots of problems and that I've joined in with a dark. The dark crowd is is but, joining my uh, group a little too much. But th- this really does show, like, uh, the idea that okay, look, there there are uh, monetary reasons to believe that inflation will continue to run hot for. Um, for you know, even the next decade, you know, as as you know, Russell and other people like that make the case. But the the argument that a lot of the deflationists have been making is about that this was just a supply issue, and that uh, and when supply normalizes, then the, the the at least on the short term, it will be transitory as things will normalize. And and when you really look at lumber, basically going from five hundred to 1800 and from 1800 back to 500 that kind of tells that story doesn't it yeah no completely agree and russell by the way is the first one to say that i know and And not only that i think this is a tiny little market that gets jerked around uh, and 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 that's one thing i i think that people need to be really really aware of is that as people were trying to hedge their quote unquote you know uh hyperinflation that they saw coming they were doing funny things and these are small markets that are easy to move around they did crazy stuff and everyone that made sales up there in lumber great good for you guys like that's great trade i and uh, i i patrick i've never once said that lumber was a you know an example of why in hyper like in even higher i never can i never said you yeah. but i'm just no, I know you don't. saying yeah, I know. that uh that it's kind of like anyway all right so that's I, but i do feel better that the certain website that you frequent uh, they they are back on the buy bonds. It's going to zero. Uh, Makes you feel better because now it now does. you can fade the other side because you, you don't like to be consensus. So it's important. I definitely do not like to be consensus, and I should have known, and I didn't. I I, got, I like I just worried that it was the the big one, and it scared me. But I really should have known, and I was like highlighting the fact that it was that we were no longer alone, and that this was a very crowded trade, and I didn't have the guts to just get off of it because I was too scared about missing the big move. And yeah. Uh, so, well, so and, Jay, if I, what, and if I had gotten off of it, you know that it would have gone to the moon. So, so I wanted to just conclude it, uh, just that important question you had in terms of uh, which crayon tastes the best. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, I have to say that the green crayon tastes the best, but the red crayon is the most addictive. Like, you just... <laughs> Just keep going back to the to the red crayon. It's weird. Anyway, uh, You're jonesy for a red one. Okay, <laughs> time for this week in trading history. What do you have for us? Well, this week we're going back to July twelfth of nineteen ninety eight, when Russia secures a eleven billion dollar financial aid package from the IMF. And so I want to talk a little bit about this uh, Russian crisis that occurred back then. Uh, it took place uh, in the first decade after uh, Russia's um, you know, transition from communism to free market economy. Uh, the Soviet Union, which uh, uh, Russia was the most important member, had a central planned economy with corresponding fixed price systems, full employment, and small income differentials. And so the uh, dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991 involved a complete overhaul of the economic system under uh, the economic team of the new president, Boris Yeltsin. Uh, This involved the large parts of the economy that were previously uh, in government hands to become privatized. But however, due to uh, the lack of strong institutions, the rule of law was weak and large parts of the economy came under the control of oligarchs. And so Russia's transition uh, to a market econ- economy was very painful one. Uh, and in the years after uh, the um, implementation of President Yeltsin's reforms, investment collapsed 
GDP started uh, to d uh, decline sharply, income inequality uh, increased rapidly, poverty became widespread. Meanwhile, hyperinflation resulting from the Ru uh, Russian central bank's loose monetary policy increased to 874% back then in 1993. That was actually uh, about five years before this event occurred. Um, but it was in 1997, so a year before, Russia's economy, economic growth turned positive for the first time since the formation of the Russian Federation in 1991. So it was the first time their economy just started to, uh, to kind of get out of this whole reform. Uh, nevertheless, the country's fixed exchange rate regime, together with its fragile uh, fiscal position, appeared to be um, unsuitable uh, when the international markets got affected by the spillover effects of financial distress else in the world, you know, uh, what was happening in Asia uh, in, the, in that period. And of course, in 1998, the outbreak of uh, that severe uh, banking, currency, and sovereign debt crisis uh, just could not be prevented. So just uh, so then came this bailout by the IMF, uh, the 11 billion dollar financial aid package. But it's really interesting the way things then evolved over the remainder of the year. A month later, August 13th in 1998, the Russian stock uh, and bond currency markets collapsed as a result of fear of a, a ruble devaluation and a default uh, on domestic debt uh, kind of circled around, stocks had lost more than 75% of their value since the beginning of the year. But it is interesting when you say 75% because it sounds a little scary. But uh, when you look at the chart, uh, the Russian stock market uh, in the prior two years, 1996 into 1997, actually went up like four or five hundred percent. So it was really it was like a lumber chart. It was it basically uh, went parabolic to the upside, and then the crisis hit, and then they wiped it all out on the downside, and just like this, this one big epic run and collapse. Uh, then five days later, obviously the stock market was reading into it correctly because uh, the, um, uh, the uh, Russian government uh, did a significant devaluation of the ruble. They defaulted on all their short-term treasury, not all of them, on a, a huge amount of their short-term treasury bills known as uh, GKOs, as well as a, a longer dated ruble denominated bonds of so the OFZs, and as well as a, a 90 day moratorium on payments by commercial banks to foreign creditors. And then uh, a, a couple weeks after that, just uh, due to just the stress they were feeling, ultimately the Russian central bank decided to remove uh, the currency corridor, making the ruble free floating currency, which caused the ruble to uh, depreciate sharply. In three weeks, the currency loses two thirds of its value, just a complete hammering of the currency. The strong depreciation resulted in sharp price increases. Inflation ran at 27% in 98, 85% in 1999 due to that uh, massive currency adjustment. And uh, as a result, food prices were uh, going uh, parabolic. Social unrest was growing. Citizens started to um, demonstrate in, uh, in various cities. And uh, it was chaos, the, the Russian crisis back then. And uh, that was uh, this week in history. So, Patrick, I was going to tell you a story about trading or talk about the GKOs and how the, that sounds like such a tough sounding uh, kind of T-bill. Like, you know, just when you say a GKO, it just sounds tough. But then I Googled um, President Yeltsin because I was remembering that he was a drunk. And I, and I, honestly, <laughs> He's a huddler. He was a huddler. <laughs> like, this guy liked his booze. And I was, I was Googling it. And now I, I've decided I got to go with this. Okay. According to history.com, and this is, uh, I, at the time, nobody knew this, but now, I guess, from a book that was published in 2009 about President Clinton, we actually know these details. Um, there was a period, I'm just going to read this, okay? Uh, and it's talking about the relationship between Bill Clinton and Boris Yeltsin. He says, but perhaps the weirdest incident in their professional relationship was when Yeltsin got drunk and wandered into the street in his underwear trying to get a pizza while he was staying at the White House. <laughs> the incident happened during Yeltsin and Clinton's first meeting in Washington in September 1994. Although there were there were glancing media reports about it over the years, it wasn't widely reported until 2009 when uh, the Clinton tapes, blah, blah, blah. Okay, here it goes. Secret service agents discovered Yeltsin alone on Pennsylvania Avenue, dead drunk, clad in his underwear, yelling for a taxi. 
Yeltsin slurred his words in a loud argument with the baffled agents. He did not go back into Blair House where he was staying. He wanted to go take a taxi and get a pizza. <laughs> when Branch asked Clinton about how the situation ended, the president shrugged and said, well, he got his pizza. <laughs> Now, how good a story is that? Like, uh, you go, you get invited to the White House. What do you do? You proceed to get just sauced out of your mind. And then, like, you know, one in the morning or whatever, you decide, I need a pizza because you got the munchies. Don't bother putting any clothes on. You just wander out looking for your pizza. Yeah. And then we were wondering why their country was having troubles at this time. All right. I uh, I shouldn't say anything else. <laughs> Hey, that's my <laughs> contribution to this week in trading history. All right. So uh, it's time for skin in the game, Kev. Oh, I lost another one, didn't I? <sighs> you know what? This you, was you, a bad just, one. you just thought, you know what, with with uh, going into OPEX, uh, when the market's quiet in the summer, you thought you were going to clip me. I did. I did. I, I You're right. I did think I was going to clip you. I did think it was going to be a good trade. It wasn't and even close. I didn't it, it, I, you didn't have a chance, bud. Not not that I had great confidence. I, I mean, I did. No, you I did. did. You, I, you I, I took I took the bet up. I, I yeah, bet up did. on it, but uh, but you no, know no, what? Hats uh, off to you. Little little golf clap for you. You know, well it, it's uh, now now is my opportunity though uh, to allow you to uh, attempt to impale yourself on your own swords by you making you choose a new bet. But before we do, why don't you explain to everyone? Uh, uh, okay. what, uh... So Skin in the Game is our weekly opportunity for us to demonstrate that we are degenerate gamblers at heart. Every week, one of us presents a wager. The other guy chooses which side of the bet he wants. Every wager needs to settle by next episode. And the currency for the wagers is as follows. A Duke and Duke, a pint of beer, a burger bet, a pitcher, a case of beer, 2-4, uh, a bottle of wine, or steak dinner. The winner of the bet is obligated to create a new bet for the following week. All wagers settle in full, and there will be no netting of positions. Now, Lena, right. hop on. Hello. Hello. Lena has been uh, our our dutiful tracker of the betting because all bets have to be settled in full. There's no netting of no positions, so we, so she's been yeah. keeping track so of this during we, COVID period because we have not been able to settle things up. Right. So Patrick, so, by the way, remembers he thinks that he was either winning or it was really well, close. I was I was almost sure that I've won way more bets. But than I you was telling I don't him, recall. He, no, I have won more, but Patrick has won the ones that count. He's won two stakes, and good for him. It's uh, and uh, we did get. I like how you uh, you kind of uh, 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 peer pressured me into giving one of my stakes to Lena, which I guess is a oh, worthy for cause. Sure. I'm, uh, for sure, it yes, is. Yes. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, so I, I and I, we're going to settle this uh, potentially up this week. Uh, we, we are. We have something uh, scheduled now that planned. We're allowed to meet again. I'm gonna I'm gonna rent uh, a pickup truck so that we can actually put all of the <laughs> alcohol that needs to be settled. Okay, Lena, uh, why don't you tell the... us what the school? Give us like who's won so, what. So total total score, Kevin. You've got 21 wins, and Patrick has 18 wins. Oh, it's close. It's close. It's, it's close. It's very yeah. close. So. Okay. Uh, Kevin, you owe $1, eight pitchers, three burger bets, two steak dinners, one case of beer, one pint, and two bottles of wine. So I was incorrect earlier before okay. we started recording. I okay. obviously don't know how to count. Okay. Um, and Patrick owes $1, 11 pitchers, four burgers, two cases of beer, two pints, and one bottle of wine. Okay. And zero steak dinners. Zero, zero steak, steak dinners. dinners. And I told Patrick, it's like backgammon. Winning the like winning the total number doesn't win matter. It's what you when you bet how much you bet that you win. That wagyu steak is going yeah, to taste butter. delicious. Okay. Oh my goodness. Uh so Patrick, you got to come up with something <laughs> right. since uh, I I I'm, I I need to clip you on this, but it, I just need you to to make the call. Ten year treasury yield. Oh. And you know what? I know you like to do all this one touch stuff and ranges and all this stuff, but I need to make your bias. Uh, do all of the work for you straight up over under 129.40 for Friday's close, buddy. Uh, okay, so that's the did you just take up? Yeah, up on yield. Okay, yeah, yeah. all right. No, yeah, I, I right, okay. right, yeah, because you're talking yield. Uh, yeah. okay, so I, I figure we have to get listen, the potential piss up is in sight. Canada is un is unwinding a lot of their restrictions. We're hoping for fall, late fall, early winter. 
uh, you know, before Canada yeah. becomes unvisitable. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I think we need another pitcher. We got to keep the pitchers right. going. What do you feel like? I feel I feel like I would be willing to go higher, but if you just want to keep it at a nice clean well, pitcher for the piss stop, I what can. What do you? Why? What are you prepared to go? No, I I just I I I think you're gonna. Do you want to do a steak dinner? Tell yourself on your own sword. Do you want to do a steak dinner? Yeah, I could do a steak okay, dinner. You're done. Okay, we're we're gonna step it up. There we go. There we go. That a boy. <laughs> Now we got a now we got a real bet some some real skin in the game. All right, one twenty nine forty. You're taking yields higher. I'm taking yields lower. Okay, you're done for a steak dinner. Done. You 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 need this one badly, buddy. Right, well, if I you, keep you got the steak dinners. It'll just be my own. Like I'll I'll have to cut myself off. <laughs> it'll just be like I'm not allowed to bet steak dinners. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's go on. Time for no stupid questions. Uh, let's get to it. Lena, what's uh, the first question so for us? The first two questions here are from two different listeners, but they are regarding uh, Cuppy. So uh, we will. We will oh, his oil trade. Yeah. <laughs> They're regarding Cuppy. Is he as crazy as he seems? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Answer yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> so the first question here, I recently discovered the market huddle and never missed an episode since. Thank you for the great content. Cuppy's idea of buying December 23 and December 25 calls seems compelling to me, yet on my interactive broker's account, there's absolutely no offer more than nine months out, let alone for December 23 or further. Do you have to use a professional broker to have access to those long dated options? All right. Go ahead, Kev. Okay. So, you know, like when you get out of bed and it's dark and you can't like there's not it's just pitch dark. The moon, the moon's kind of covered. There's like it's a it's one of those nights and you're just feeling around in the dark trying to figure out how to get to the bathroom. OK, that's like how you have to trade these. <laughs> and I'm, I'm being a little facetious, but the reality is that there is liquidity there. They just don't post it. Yeah. And so what you need to do is figure out. Um, what the last price was, okay, you'll see a settlement. So this is what I suggest. Figure out the previous settlement. So let's just imagine it's seven bucks, okay? Take that seven bucks, figure out roughly what the delta is. Like it's probably going to be like 40 or something like that. Figure out how much the uh, crude oil contract has moved. Let's say it's moved a dollar, so if it's moved a dollar downward and you have that seven dollar previous close, your, your, your you move it down forty, 40 cents. cents. So the previous settlement I means so the equivalent settlement would be six sixty or something like that. So just stick out a bid, uh, put it in at six twenty or something like that below, and wait for an offering. Now there might not be one. Uh, they'll either show you an offering, show you what price that they're willing to sell it to you. Or what you'll have to do is just leave it there and then walk it up. And just yeah. be a nickel. Do you go a nickel at a time oh, or a dime? It depends or on the you... option, right? But this this is this is standard fare. You might just leave it there, let people see it, because the reality is that when you go to those options, they're not moving around a lot. That that contract is all way less volatile than the front contract yeah. already. And then not only that, there's a lot of what they call Vega on that trade. So you might just stick it in there and wait. And so the reality is, no, you do not need uh, a professional broker. And I know for a fact that Cuppy actually buys it through interactive brokers. So it's just a question of having the confidence to put it out there and uh, make sure you don't you put it. a bad price at first. So the key yeah. is make very sure that you don't go and stick in like if it's, it's let's say, last at 7 bucks and you put in a $10 bid. You're going to get hit at $10 and it's going to be a terrible price. Because there was no offering on the board. That's what's going to happen sure. is you're going to go bid and then someone's going to hit you. So because there's no market, you need to be extra special careful. You do not want to fat finger that one. Yeah. All right, Leanne, what's the second part? Second part here. Hello, Market Huddle. I'm a big fan of your podcast. And I've learned so much over the past year and more by listening to your show. I rec recently listened to your episode with Cuppy and was curious about the long oil strategy. I looked up the option chain for crude oil futures, but the latest options I saw were for December 2021. 20 
What instrument or ticker should I be looking for if I want it to be long call option for oil futures in 2025? Or should I look for ETNs like BNO, OIL, USO for the long oil play? Thank you and love your podcast and team. All right. Well, if you're looking at uh, options on futures, you should be able to see the 2025s. They go out even much farther than that. Uh, so I'm not sure why that chain stopped. Uh, or just uh, there's no quotes. He them. might have had the same problem as the other May, person. Maybe, right? but there, are, but there are there are on option. You just have to whatever broker you're using. You just have to go farther uh, out on there and see what what that month expiration is. But the the second part of the question is: Is there an ETN or something that you could use as an alternative to play the oil long? And what I thought Kev would be a really good opportunity for us to just help um, our listeners understand term structure in oil and where all these ETNs tend to buy and why they're not a good way to play Cuppy's call. And, you're, and you have a similar view, which is the, the longer term oil has room to go up. Uh, and so, uh, so here, what this term tru- structure is showing is that each one of the futures contracts all the way out to 2031 have a different price. And this is the forward price of crude oil. And this is uh, a called backwardation when the price is cheaper every month that you're going out. Um, and so the, the spot or front month contracts of crude oil up in the 70s, but even going out of one or two years, you're down in the mid to low 60s and going up uh, three, four, five years, you're down in the mid 50s in crude oil uh, over the long term. And so uh, uh, that the view on this oil play is that as time passes, uh, that these uh, what are these long term prices of crude oil will inevitably be much, much higher in their price. The problem with all these ETNs and all these like USO, they're only playing the front of the curve. Uh, now, in the case of USO, I know that they uh, they kind of distribute it amongst the first one year of oil contracts. So you do have a little bit of that term structure uh, kind of average price in, but it's certainly not. Uh, there is no ETN that I'm aware of for playing that long-term oil play. Are you aware of that? Um, Any so there is one that does uh, balance it out more so and doesn't just do the first couple of months, but goes out, I think, about a year, and that is UCO, and that's the ProShares Ultra Bloomberg Crude Oil Exchange Traded Fund. The trouble is I think it only goes out a year. Again, it's also a, a double uh, kind of a two times, and whenever you get it two times, you're going to get um, – uh, the decay of volatility generally working against you as the whipping back and forth will do it. So to me, I don't I don't think that this is a way to play it either. It's not something you want to own longer term. Anytime you're dealing with an ETF that deals in leverage, it's something that should only be held uh, for short periods of time. And you should be really worried about the fact that this will decay downward over a longer period. So generally what I would conclude and you can tell me whether you agree or disagree but i think if our listeners if you're if you're not comfortable with the futures markets or understand how options pricing works uh it's better not to play this trade uh, i think that uh, you need to have a little level of sophistication to join cuppy in his uh, in his little adventure here <laughs> that's, that's probably a good piece of advice Patrick. All right. Lena, what's next? So next question. Hi, all. Retail investors have a lot of competition on the market in the form of algos. They are savvy. They are fast. They will be around for a long, long time, but they will never go for a beer on a Friday night after the bell. Oh, man. That's too bad. <laughs> question number one. What would be obvious signs of their presence that we can easily spot on a chart? And question number two. What would be good ways to take advantage of them that we could use in our trading? All right, I'm going to take the first tab, Kevin, and then you can kind of critique okay. my, my assessment of this. But really, uh, algos uh, are um, very short-term in nature, and they try to take advantage of, uh, of you know, front-running a bid or doing whatever uh, short-term price action. And so really, it's all really about the most intraday of charts and the day traders that are trying to compete with them on very short time frames where – where algos become an issue, but the moment you change your time frame, uh, whether to uh, you know trying to catch trends over several days or or weeks or or try to play play bigger macro moves, there is 
very little to almost no influence of uh, of these algos onto whether or not you're going to be right about that prevailing trend. And so really, the this question to kind of observe these types of things is really all about whether you want to play the day trading game on a very short term basis. Um, what would you say? I to would that? agree uh, with the with a kind of couple caveats that I would I would say. Um, yes, there are uh, algos that are more of HFT variety, and that's basically what you're talking about. But then there's also um, algos that are institutional size orders that are designed to trade throughout the day. And you can see these, and if you wanted to think about how to incorporate them into your trading, one of the ideas might be that if you see a stock that is obviously in accumulation mode, meaning that there's a large VWAP or TWAP or participation order that's going to be there, it's likely going to continue to keep the stock bid and that you won't get the pullbacks that you're looking for. And I'll just talk briefly about the changes that have occurred throughout the decades as we've been trading and as algos and, I, and I'm, I'm talking more about the latter type of algos, meaning that the institutional order algos, how they've affected trading. In, the, in my old day when I was on the desk, we, would, we almost never had VWAPs. Like I remember there was the occasional client that tried to give us VWAPs and we'd always be like, Ugh, like it was like a pain in the butt. We didn't want them. Most orders on the institutional desk were done with blocks or, you know, uh, you know, smaller pieces and they would bid and get hit and things like that. It, it just wasn't uh, uh, something that the algos did. But as the algos became more prevalent and more of these clients started to use them, it changed the way the trading occurred. So no longer did you get these kind of spikes higher as someone reached for liquidity and it became much more because the order was divided throughout the day it became much more steady and in the past if you had a spike higher all the old time traders would be tempted to sell it because someone was demanding liquidity and that someone demanding liquidity means that eventually they'll go away or it'll get filled and then it'll dip back down it'll you know there was a, a move away from the fair value with this new era of algos, what you find is those spikes, the, the kind of correction almost never happen. Yeah. You get a spike higher as the, you know, the algo demands initial liquidity, and, it and then it just kind of grinds higher from there. And when I'm thinking about how I uh, kind of incorporate algos into my trading, it's in the idea that the nature of trading has changed and that many times these algos that are set for the whole day go the whole day. Another way to think about it is like, let's say you were in a trending day, which is occurs way more than it ever has. You would wait for, and you wanted to sell something that was being accumulated. You might not sell it right away. You might wait till the end of the day because in general, so, it, we close at the higher end of the, uh, the range much more so than we ever have. So that might just be so something I, to think about. Yeah. I just uh, to to kind of contribute to that. So I've, obviously I um, uh, stereotype my view of algos as high frequency. But if you're talking about these types of trades that are on for the whole day, just accumulating uh, on a from a technical perspective, what that, what that would look like is what's known as a bullish uh, belt hold line on a candlestick chart, which is essentially uh, where the, the the full body of the candle is just all green or red, which is that it's a sustained buying or sustained selling the entire day. And so maybe from a technical perspective, that's what you would see um, visually to one of the types of uh, sequences that you just re referenced here. There we go. I never knew. All right. A, a, a bullish belt hold day. A belt hold line. Oh, whatever. It just, all it's right. A, anyway, Lena, next. Hey, guys. Huge fan and a second time stupid question submitter. How would a lone 39-year-old retail trader go about entering the industry? I've been trading for three years now, and the last two of which were profitable, but I feel like I have gone as far as I can go trading in a vacuum and wish to be around others doing the same work. I think that is the next step to further my growth, education, and understanding. Would a prop shop be the right path? Keep in mind, I never went to college, so I don't have that piece of fiat paper declaring 
I paid someone to confirm I know things I may not have actually learned. Is there any way a trader can break the solitude that isn't a chat room filled with money losing degenerates? Thank you. Do you want to take it or read Patrick? No. Nope. Okay. You, you please. Uh, <laughs> it's a great question. I, I love it. Um, yeah, it's gotten harder in terms of our industry because the reality is that in the old days, there would be a lot of more um, mundane tra uh, duties that traders would do that would enable you to get on the desk and be around other traders. I remember reading the stat that Goldman Sachs at one point had 200 equity traders and it's down to two now with a bunch of programmers. And the yep. whole nature of trading has changed. So some of my, the advice I would have given 10 or 20 years ago has completely changed. There is no doubt that a prop group would be a great uh, way to do it. And one of the nice things about prop groups is that you're around other people like yourself. And you've correctly noticed that that is a big part of it. And just being around people that are doing different things with different ideas, um, it kind of just gets those creative juices flowing and and there's and I would highly recommend it um, in terms of other jobs I would probably say that most other jobs that you would actually go get you would probably be very frustrated very quickly you would have rules about what you're allowed to trade for your own account you would very uh, it would be very unlikely that you would be allowed to trade uh, anything for the firm and uh, be even more unlikely that you'd be taking orders from clients. It would be uh, most likely a frustrating experience for someone that is of your age and that has already been doing trading. So I would recommend trying to figure out a place where you can uh, learn. And a prop shop is a great example. Now you say that there's a chat rooms with filled with money losing degenerates. No doubt there's probably some really bad ones out there. I don't know, but there's probably some good ones too. And in this day and age, I know like for my group, we were in a room before and when the COVID hit, we all went home and we created, uh, we were wondering like how we can talk to each other. And we just ended up getting on a discord server and we, we talked that way. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be so sure that you couldn't find a group that is open to accepting other individuals and I don't know where to find them. I don't know how to give you advice about that, but I just would say, don't, don't uh, kind of rule out the chat room uh, as being a full of money, losing degenerates. You just have to find the right chat room. And I would argue that you'd probably be better off finding a smaller group uh, that is uh, more specialized into the types of trading that you like to do. So good luck. I hope you make it. Yeah. All right, we've got a couple more. Is the reflation trade strengthening or rolling over? Well, Kev, I want your opinion on this so huh. bad. Well, no, but you got charts and stuff already here, so I'm going to let you go first. Uh, no, you go first. Okay. Is the reflation <laughs> trade strengthening or rolling over? From a technical point of view, there's no doubt that uh, Patrick, when he argues that it's rolling over, he's going to be correct. Uh, from a fundamental point of view, I, I would contend that the, uh, the backdrop for this trade is getting better, not worse. Perfect. I, uh, with you saying something so kind to me, I don't think I want to gooch her up by saying anything else. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Lena, well, next question. This is the last one for this week. I feel like I've woken up and it's opposite day. Inflation is apparently now bad for gold, and the market thinks the Fed can raise interest rates and f fight inflation. Has everyone lost their mind? Or am I missing something? The market seemed broken to me. What needs to happen for people to realize the Fed can't do shit to fight inflation? Who cares about two rate hikes in 2023? It ain't doing shit. Thanks, Patrick, for teaching your gold leap strategy. It was a stressless roll down today. I hope I owe you a beer for that one. Nice. Kev... What do you, what's your uh, take on uh, the way the markets are trading here? So, you know, I went through what I think is happening in terms of the, the Fed making a shift and that shift ending up being perceived as hawkish and therefore slowing down the economy and flattening the curve. And it does feel a little bit like a Costanza in that the uh, strong market 
or strong economic res, uh, numbers results in bonds being bought. The uh, the opposite of what you'd expect, right? And um, I don't know what to say, you know, apart well, from that I'm a balding middle aged man who lives with my mom. Okay, and, well, uh, would you like to go? Out? <laughs> no, um, <laughs> <laughs> well, listen, what my my. Uh, my take is that there's a cyclicality to this. And, you know, while um, the secular inflation theme has merit, you know, and like, for instance, this is why the Russell Napiers have uh, been coming out with new uh, big macro themes over the next decade of, of why, you know, higher sustained inflation is a possibility. But there is still a cyclicality to it. And these uh, reflationary and disinflationary impulses come in and out of the market. And the one thing that we have to say about that November impulse that really lasted almost six months, it was an extraordinary run with a big overshoot and a lot of things looked really thing. And, and inevitably, there's, an, uh, there's another side to it and there's going to be a reversion. And I think that the Fed is uh, simply was the excuse to, to do, uh, kind of begin uh, uh, the turn of the cycle. I don't think the Fed was, uh, it, it's not really about it, their 2023 outlook. It was just that the market was uh, so uh, convinced and it was such a consensus trade that inevitably some sort of a profit-taking cycle had to start on this whole trade. And it just so happened that that became the catalyst that everyone's anchoring on is my interpretation. I, I don't disagree, it. Patrick. That's a good way of putting it. I'm not, I, I feel like that's, I'm going to leave that because that's, uh, you know, perfection. All right. Lena, where can people submit not stupid questions, the only stupid answers we get? They get they they have great if questions. If you have any questions for Kevin and Patrick, please submit your questions to no stupid questions at markethuddle.com. Okay, folks. All thanks right. for tuning in to the Market Huddle. We appreciate you spending some time with us. Please give us a follow on Twitter at the Market Huddle. Lena's there. She's through ten thousand. We should get her through twenty thousand. Uh, and I know she gets tired of talking to Patrick and myself. And her GIF game is outstanding. Or GIF. I don't know what I'm supposed to say. Uh, you can listen to the Market Huddle on all the networks. Google Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, Spotify, Android Play, iTunes, and YouTube. A lot of people watch on YouTube to see all of our charts and visuals. And while you're there, please like and subscribe to get our latest content. And please, if you could, rate and review us on iTunes. It's a dumb game, but it makes a difference with Apple's algorithm and helps us out immensely. Patrick, where can they find you? You can find me on Twitter at Patrick Ceresna, and uh, you can follow me at BigPictureTrading.com. And Kev, where can they follow you and your uh, newsletter? I'm at uh, Twitter at Kevin Muir, and you can check out my newsletter at TheMacroTourist.com. And listen, we can never have too many friends at Bear Market, Bull Market. We're just happy to spend some time together on this crazy ride. So thanks for tuning in. Now stick around for the after show. Oh, well, that was a good show. Yes. We're going to get out of here early. <laughs> <laughs> well, what happened? I wouldn't call I wouldn't call this a short show. No, it, no, I mean, we, we did. <laughs> we got to rate the beer. <laughs> That's right. Alita's like, are you going to we Because we didn't clear three and a half hours on this episode. <laughs> well, it's a short show. <laughs> I, I do believe there's a very large amount of listeners that will not call this a short <laughs> show. <laughs> It does have a little bit of the Lord of the Rings epic trial, trial, yeah. trilogy, trilogy to it. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, you want to start by rating okay. the beer? Um, I like it. It's good. It, it, the nitro scared me, but I shouldn't have been scared by it. A solid beer. Very tasty. Going 8-2. Eight 8-2? Two. Eight two? All right. Lena, how about well, you? I basically chugged it before I started reading the questions, so that's why I was stumbling my words there. Um, I would give this an 8.7. Mm. You know, um, uh, I also thought it was a great beer. I'm a, I'm a big fan of Pilsners. Uh, and the one thing for me, though, is I don't know whether the nitrogen um, made a Pilsner taste better than a normal Pilsner would be. And, and so this was uh, a great tasting Pilsner. I'm not so convinced that they made it better by uh, nitroing it up, uh, but it did taste great. So I'm, uh, I'm going to give it an 8.1. Oh, my I'm gonna goodness. I'm going to go on the lower that end. That is but the it, tightest I, I, range we've ever been. <laughs> yeah, it's so true. Yeah. But you know what? It's a good beer. I would definitely drink multiple ones of these. It's it, it's a it like uh, it's just simply I don't think the nitro really adds to it. I think it's a gimmick more than it is uh, uh, so flavor. We all need gimmicks. Some of us drink beers on podcasts as gimmicks. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, some of. <laughs> 
Okay. I, I would never imagine using yeah, gimmicks for that. Uh, okay, so what are we going to talk about? I've got nothing. I got a new show, but I'm embarrassed about oh. it. Oh, what is yeah, it? Th- then we have to talk about it. <laughs> I'm, I am embarrassed. Like, you know, so Patrick t- told the world about Archer. I went and listened to it, watched it, and it was good. But I was kind of embarrassed for Patrick when he told us about it because it's, it's just like literally it's, I don't know, like... It's an 14, epic show. I'm sorry, year old but me would have loved it. Would have thought it was. Oh, awesome. come, give me a break! It's still my favorite show. I, I don't watch much TV at all yeah. uh, or or movies. It just but, shows uh, your Archer, Archer's my go-to. Either. That's your favorite show. <laughs> now, <laughs> this show could be worse. Oh, what is? Okay, it? okay, and 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 I don't know if either. Well, Patrick knows because I was telling him about it. But Lena, you probably I probably didn't talk to you about it. It's a Canadian show. And for the longest time, it looks too stupid for me to even try. And I don't know what got me to try it. And then it became like, I, you know, that TV show, uh, A&E, when they have interventions? Okay. I feel like that's what they need to do for me on this thing. Oh, no. What is it? It's called Letter Kenny. Oh. Thank you. It's an epic show. It Hi. is so stupid. It's an epic it show. It is just dumb. Like, literally, like, it is, I'm embarrassed. Like, I'm honestly embarrassed. Oh, come on. No, it is great. I mean, it's, it's, it's like embarrassing. Wa- no, it's not embarrassing. It's a Patrick, great, it's, it's a great it's show. It's embarrassing. There's way too much. You can fart. be embarrassed by it. I would, but listen, I've humor, already way too much uh, like juvenile humor. But there are. Moments I'm sorry, but that's that's bril- my level of comedy. <laughs> there are moments of brilliance in this show, and the just the strangeness of it. It's. Uh, have you watched Alina? No, I have not. Uh, so let's first of all let's check out how many tomatoes it's got. Let's just see what the tomatoes. <laughs> I've heard of it, but I've never. Yeah, you know what? I, 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 I got. Oh, it's. Uh, but, it's, it's it's a proper show. 90 tomatoes. Okay, so at least the tomatoes is right. Uh, first of all, I was shocked that Americans watch this. Oh, because, really? No, honest, <laughs> no, really. And, oh, it's, it's it's just like Trailer Park Boys. It, yeah, I guess it is a little like Trailer Park Boys. In a sense that, like, uh, it's, 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 it's the so only thing that people Cana- find funny about Canadians. There's so much Canadian-specific <laughs> humor in there. I don't even know how Americans get half the jokes. Like, it, it's a lot of inside baseball about, like, Canadian jokes. And it's it's this it's this crew that are farmers and and the funny thing about it is like I know people like this and it's just like, <laughs> that's the Wait, funny like, part of us. Farmers goodness, from you're where? just like oh my god! I like I like this is like perfect. And the guys from this place in in kind of up uh, Listo Listowell. I don't know how to say it, but it's kind of uh, near Owen Sound uh, up that okay. way. In, in um, kind of it's not northern Ontario. What would they call that? Northern, Southern Ontario, like it's it's farm country, yeah, and it's this you know good looking um, kind of Canadian actor that somehow has gone and made this show, and it is it is crazy stupid and just hilarious. I don't know, I don't know what to say about it. I'm uh, embarrassed. You know I'm what? Embarrassed that I like it. The uh, the, re- the reason it resonates with me is because uh, it does remind me like of of my childhood. Like uh, I uh, I grew up in my early early y- uh, youth. Youth. Um, <laughs> uh, my youth uh, was uh, was in like uh, Bradford, oh, Ontario, yeah. near the Holland For March. Sure. And and uh, and I I went to, to school with uh, a lot of characters. And uh, and this show yeah, resonates sure. with me. And it's, the uh, of it's stupid uh, sayings that you like. I find myself saying, like they say, "Pitter patter, let's get at her." I find myself <laughs> saying this all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and they just like a, a whole bunch of just stupid, stupid things, and they just like it gets at you, and it just infects your brain. Like it's now I'm it's, scared to watch it. Yeah, no, you got to watch it, Lena. It is it so is, funny. It is. It is really uh, so good, yet so bad. You know, I, I gotta like, be honest. I, I, if it's a Canadian show or a movie, I, I tend to not watch them. Well, I was the same way. I was like, "What is this crazy thing?" And the guy's got this weird demeanor, and, and uh, I don't know. I just uh, let me tell you. The- All right, Lena. I'm, I'm right now on, on the WhatsApp. I'm gonna post you uh, the, a video clip I have on my phone from uh, Letter Kenny. The uh, okay. So here, I'll give you one to start with that that basically sums it up. Okay, watch season two, episode three, relationships. And okay. like the, the section before the, like, you know, they have an open section. That, that is crude, raunchy, and just hilarious. And it's, uh, if, you, if you like that, you'll like the whole show. But you have to understand that that's what, it's, what you're going to get. 
I'll have to report back to you next week. Okay. There Season you go. two, episode you should, three. You should have that on your phone. Ships. Okay. <laughs> Just anyways. <laughs> On to the next thing. Oh, you we know, know what? Maybe, maybe on, maybe on Twitter, uh, we should uh, post a couple of these clips so that well, our I, our, you know uh, me, our listeners have already started to using it. And, <laughs> yeah. and you know who the it's best hilarious. guy is the the bigger guy, uh, Cur- Squirrely Dan. I can't remember his name. Squirrely <laughs> Dan, I think. And Squirrely Dan is the funniest because he says everything like "use guys." He puts an S on everything. Oh no! And actually, I was thinking about how, as an actor. How difficult it would be to do it. And there's so many linguistic things that they do that are just so ridiculous that are wrong. And just like it's like they talk about people being homophobics with an X. And like there's just so many things. Oh my just, gosh. It is so funny. Anyways, uh, give it a shot. That's not how we really talk up here though. It's, 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 yes, it is. It's, <laughs> it's pretty funny. Uh, Lena, what are you watching? Hopefully something more uh, kind of cerebral. Oh, no. and... you, you know you know me, murder mysteries. I oh. watched um, this documentary. Like a, I think it's a four-part series. Elise Matsunaga. It's like a Brazilian murder mystery. This woman that went and killed her husband and dismembered him. And he was like a billionaire, one of the richest guys really? in Brazil. Yeah, this happened like 10 years ago. Yeah. And they talk about why she did it, how she did it, and she tells her story because I guess they get like a furlough five times a year. So she's out from prison five times a year for like a week every time. Okay. And then she's doing this documentary. <laughs> <laughs> I got a week off for prison? Let's yeah. Make a documentary. Like, that's kind of how and it aren't starts. they worried about out. like, you know, when you give uh, like, obviously she killed him for the money, but what about like a serial it, killer? But it wasn't for the money. So it's, it's like, it's, it's. Why was it? She just mad at him? Yeah, there's more layers to it. Like every episode they reveal something and you're like, oh. Does she admit that she oh, killed yeah. him? She I don't understand it. anybody that can then can dismember someone. Like I don't get it. Yeah. I can't even do like I wouldn't be able to like first of all I can't kill a moose like some other animal that we know. Um and then <laughs> and then the idea of having to cut the animal up. Like I get it. Animal I'm not is trying one to, thing, but like Yeah, like, person. And then, like I can do a moose and forget about like what it must be like to do a person. Jeez, I know. Like it's just I don't get it. Now Luke Patrick, so I'm not judging because right it's like, a lot it's 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 a lot like cutting chicken. Oh. Is it? Yeah, you gotta get around that bone when you're. Are you talking about? Are you talking about the person chicken? or the moose? <laughs> the chicken. Squirrels. Talk, squirrels. Anyway, <laughs> squirrels. <laughs> the squirrels. The good thing about the squirrels is you just leave the bones in there and you just mash it up. Oh my god! No, poor squirrel. Oh, you, uh, you want to know think... something funny? My dog. Uh, uh, you a squirrel? No, didn't eat a squirrel. Although you know it's a, 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 a strange story. You know how terriers. Terriers are basically rodent killers, right? It's like, right. Like, like one of those Jack Russells that are like made to go into like tunnels and like mm-hmm. tunnels and stuff yeah. like that. So you ever get like a terrier? That's why they're always going crazy for the squirrels. Well, I had a buddy that had a, a Wheaton Terrier, and that's the one of the bigger ones. That's about the biggest of the terriers. And he said that he was so fast he would catch a squirrel a couple times a year, and he says it was so terrible because he'd be at the park. And like all the little kids would be there and everything, and then this thing would catch oh, a squirrel, no. and like you know how they kill it, like by and shaking then they like it and shake stuff. it off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it just be like, oh, it just be terrible. Oh, so my dog can't kill anything. No, my dog, like I have a big Newfoundland, so she can't kill anything. But she did. <laughs> we left out some chicken on the on the on the um, countertop. Like dead chicken. Yeah, like that's chicken like, meat. No, we got live chickens in our house. <laughs> <laughs> No, like a, a Swiss LA finished chicken, like a know, real killer, chicken. like, and um, she ate the whole thing, bones and all. Oh my gosh, and she's okay. She ate. Yeah. All well, of course she's. They're not gonna pick no, around the bones. Bonus, like it could yeah, be it's dangerous. Not very, it's not very dogs. good for you. Yeah. Yeah. So I safe. looked it up, and I'm supposed to give her like you give her some bread, and then you gotta watch it, and yeah. So, but anyways, that's that's. Uh, well, she had the best meal of her life. Probably. Well, not really. Like sitting there chewing on the bones. There was there was one. There was one time um, uh, uh, my uh, brother-in-law's uh, dog, he has this uh, big uh, chocolate lab, like a 120-pound oh, monster. Yeah, yeah. No, it's like yeah, yeah. huge. Like, it was over 100 okay. pounds, like this monstrous one. And it was, um, it was Christmas dinner, and uh, the, the mother-in-law made a, 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 a 
potato salad that was going to feed 30 oh people. Like, you're ta- thinking like a monster <laughs> salad bowl full of potato know what salad. Look like to feed and 30. there was no room in the fridge for this thing, so they put it out on the front porch somewhere to keep it cold uh, <laughs> over the holidays. And that fucking dog goes out there. And eats the entire <gasps> bowl. This thing looked pregnant. Oh like the dog, like literally digested this entire thing and ate the saran oh wrap on yeah, top of it too. Well, so listen, when we got ours, Newfoundland, we we didn't realize that she would get up on she could get up on counters because our previous dogs weren't that big. And they didn't actually want that to eat. They weren't like they were um they were like a border beer to collie, so they didn't really like food as much. Um, but this one was like hungry, and so we did. She ate a whole loaf of bread the first night we had her, uh, wow. and she didn't take it out of the bag. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> and they like, just where's the it loaf of bread? It, oh, they it? just ate the whole thing, an entire loaf of bread. Uh, <laughs> and then it comes out uh, as, <laughs> as, as one big. <laughs> Uh, and I remember, I remember guy on our street was telling, like, when we got her, so we're walking around this big Newfoundland, he's like, oh, you got a Newfoundland, and he goes, well, let me tell you the story about, like, when last time I was around in Newfoundland, and it was, it was a similar story to Patrick's, in that they had, uh, but the, it was a turkey, and it was, like, Christmas, and sure enough, what had happened was the lady had put it on the, uh, the counter, like, the island to cool, oh. And everyone, had, you know, was out, you know, waiting and ta- chatting in the other room. And this Newfoundland proceeded to eat, like, the vast majority of the turkey. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and what, what's amazing is sometimes these dogs know they did something wrong. And so they give you those puppy eyes stare like mad. they know they're about to get in shit. Uh, and they're just, like, staring because they know they're guilty yeah. as fuck. It's hilarious. <laughs> Master anyway. manipulators, that's what I call them. Yeah, well, a lab. Uh, they're, the labs right. are the worst. They'll eat everything. Like they're the absolute brutal. Like, yeah, they're they're the raccoons of the dogs. They're uh, like basically that's what I feel like. I'm like that. I not just my like, dog. She's spoiled. You just she doesn't like to eat certain foods, and she has to eat. It has to be a certain size. It could be a carrot. If it's not like bite size for her, she'll like spit it out. Yeah, <laughs> it has to be a certain size, and then she'll chew it up and eat it. Oh, spoiled, spoiled dog. Look at that. Okay. All right. Anyway, let, we'll wrap it up. Uh, have a great weekend, everyone. Take care. Have a good. All right. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>